Oh, of course I didn't share my screen. Genius. Every single week, I never share the screen in time. Here we go. And I think we're in. Welcome everyone to the show. Let's have a look quickly and see if it's all good. Just checking, making sure the laptop's catching up to everything. Welcome, all of you. Can't believe, can't believe you're all here already. Thank you all so much for joining. Uh, let's start. Zane, Ben, Maz, Williams Watches, uh, Truth Fears. I think I saw Founder Times Capital. Justin Bailey, welcome. Shane, Chip, so good to have you all here. Thank you all for joining. Let me know if you can hear me. Comment one in the chat and we can get started. Uh, this is a bit strange because it's a, it's a week after the first, uh, the first show, wrist shot week from previous week. And uh, the whole idea was for me to keep this impromptu and not, you can hear me? It's fantastic. Thank you. Welcome, Blue Shirt and everyone else, Chili Badger. So uh, I did not expect to run the show, but I received so many submissions. By Monday, I had 100 already in my inbox and thought, you know what? Let's do another one this week. I wanted to keep it low and casual. So there's tons of watches. As you see on the left-hand side of the screen, as I scroll through, there's plenty of submissions. And yeah, we're going to have fun like we always do. This is a time when we can sit back, relax. I hope you're drinking something nice. And we can have a great discussion around all of these pieces. Eric Bell from Loch Lomond, Thomas Burnett, Doc Baps, thank you all so much for joining. And for those of you who are new to the show, I think I will just give you a quick run through of what this is. Wrist Shot Week was an idea, thanks to Zane, actually. He, he said, why not feature a, a portion of the show where you look at people's wrist shots? And so many submissions came in that it turned into a show <laughs> for us. <laughs> Stop playing us, five-hour drainer today, Zane. <laughs> um, so the idea behind this whole series is that we get to see what everyone else is wearing, not what social media advertises and markets. We get to see a bit more of an intimate look into what everyone is enjoying in our community. Okay, let's get right into it. So of course, I'm wearing the, the old faithful. I haven't taken this piece off for a month and a half at this point. It just works like a dream. And interestingly, I wanted to focus the show around a very specific Rolex that came in from Graham to reference 5508. And this was originally the cover photo before one minute late. <laughs> yeah, Zane, I know. I have such a great watch that tells excellent time. You know what the thing is? It's it's me pouring myself a cup of coffee and also sound deadening the room before I sit down. It's all sorts of rubbish that goes on behind the scenes. Anyway, this 5508 came in and I was like, wow, this has to be featured. At least it should be the cover photo. It was originally, but uh, things changed and I decided, no, it needs to be something a bit different. Anyway, what's interesting about this piece? 5508 made in 1958 and Graham bought it in 1995 for, wait for it, $800. So a bit of a wake up call. Now you might be asking yourself, what makes this watch and this watch fascinating as a pairing? Well, they were both made in the same time. My thinking was before getting into the, the submissions, let's have a quick look at these two pieces. These were both from Philips. I love that there's some, some congruence between the images, so we get to see the pairing together. These two watches were made in the same time period. We could both say they came out 58, 57. And I love seeing the, the comparison between them both, just how their designs were so different. And there are elements from each that I like and dislike, of course. So let's run through them briefly before getting into the other pieces. I mean, the Submariner is timeless at this point. But I think the Seamaster did a few things better in a few places. Namely, the one detail that I like so much, the indices. The fact that the, the minute track is very elongated, matches the numerals on the bezel, I mean, on the dial, excuse me, uh, where the Rolex doesn't have that extra detail. But then the Rolex dial is much easier to read, more Bauhaus, where this is more symmetrical. I also enjoy the numeral slash baton layout on the Seamaster. And... Oh, they're just all sorts of little little uh, details. Uh, the bezel, this has a time reserve bezel, the Seamaster, compared to your countdown bezel that we, that we know nowadays. And uh, yeah, it's fascinating is that the, the Submariner at this stage was about 37 and a half millimeters, where the Omega was 39. So it's crazy how Omega, at least on the outset, looks like they were looking a little bit more forward into the, the contemporary sizing of the time. 
so it's great. This was my way of just waking up and getting into the show. There's many comments going on behind the scenes. So welcome to all of you. Thank you all so much for joining. And uh, let's see, Chaitan says, you don't need to hoard five identical protects in a bank safe to have an opinion on watches. No, I don't think so. We all do. And uh, this is definitely not a preaching session from me. I am most definitely doing this just to present what everyone is sharing with all of us. And Maz, thank you so much for joining. Don't worry, your watch is going to be on the show. And uh, yeah, let's get right into it. So what I'm wearing, good old faithful, thought I'd feature this as well. A hobby that my old man and I picked up a few months ago is restoring classic dinky toys. I don't know if any of you had these as children, but uh, you know they were made in the late 50s, early 60s. And yeah, we really enjoy it. So getting the paint going, the set sold today, which is cool. And uh, these are all originals. I think we have HMWs, we have Talbots, we have, uh, this is a McLaren, I can't remember, McLaren and a Ferrari. Um, yeah, anyway, going through, I think there's an Austin in here as well. So as we keep rolling through, great watch. Uh, this was on my Strat earlier this week. I'm really enjoying the photography. If you don't, uh, if you don't follow me on Instagram, I'm, I'm kind of pushing it out too much at this point. Uh, but it's nice seeing the, the, the faux radium effect with the two-tone or the sunburst and headstock shot. Let me just get back to you. I'm definitely going to try and up the pace today because uh, it generally I, uh, I spend too much time on watches and I need to, you know, there's so many submissions that I need to run through them quicker. And I hope to address all of you as well. The pickups are magnets. I know CW, uh, it's very dangerous, but I mean, the, the Amiga is anti-magnetic completely. So anyway, I'm Les, absolutely, but Owens. Yeah, this is my only my only electric guitar I have at the moment. My others are in storage, but uh, it's a American special Strat that I pretty much stripped and replaced all the parts. So we have clues and tuners. Uh, I refinished the neck. You can see the neck is quite dark and all of these little bits and pieces. Um, yeah, so let's get beyond this and get to the show because it's going to be a long one. Uh, watch habit. Yeah, great having you here. Thank you for joining. I see many of you are tagging me in the in the chat. Honeymoon phase with the Seamaster BS. You know, it's it's a weird thing. I must say there must be some uh, believability in the idea that this could be the honeymoon phase, but it just doesn't come off. Um, I don't see a need to wear anything else. I use the bezel at least three or four times a day. Let's give it a, a bit of a turn. You can have a listen. I don't know if the mic will pick it up. Probably not. I don't know. You can you can let me know in the comments. Um, but yeah, I need to get into these watches because there are so many that came in. So Neil sends in a Tudor Pelagos, and I think he sent this in twice. And uh, this this whole format, this arrangement of the shot is perfect for a cover photo. So it began with Graham's 5508, but uh, turned into the Pelagos left-hand drive. It's a great piece. I think the lighting is nice. We get to see a bit of a autumn-ish background there. We've got jerseys and everything else. Um, and it's, it's interesting to see that some people wear the left-hand drive on their left wrists because they don't want the, uh, oops, oh no, magic mouse, don't break my heart. Uh, they enjoy it on their left wrist because the crown doesn't dig into their hand. I don't know if that's the, the usual, usual situation. Uh, and there's a few left-hand drives on the show. <laughs> Tommaso ASMR bezel. Yeah, I don't know what that sounded like. It probably wasn't very good. I'll try again. That might have been a bit better. I'm only turning it uh, one way. No, Neil, don't worry about it. The double send is fine. Uh, great shot, by the way. I love this photo. No, it's good. I, uh, it's, it's difficult at times to keep up with the amount of emails coming in. Again, I will say that <laughs> so many were sent in. I wanted this to be an understated show. I really wasn't planning on doing one of these, but just thought, you know what? And if you're keen, you can send in more uh, next week or whatever else. You can see what happens. This is just a time when we get to sit down and enjoy ourselves. Okay, so there's a few more of you that I haven't said hi to. Aldebert, Ad Adlebert, I never get your name right, brother. Uh, Edward, Ant, great to have you all here. Also, bad news, by the way. We don't have a single lunger on the show, which is very unfortunate, but other pieces make up for it. Okay, so thank you, Neil, for this. Great seeing this piece. Ten minutes in and we're motoring. Fantastic. Okay, next to Adam. Adam sent in a Hoyer Pro Monin Diver. I've got no idea 
where this piece originates. I think he said in the 90s, late 90s, early 2000s. And looking at the case construction, this looks to be one that mirrors the uh, the C masters of no, the CWCs from the 70s and the 80s. You know, the crown guard setup looks very much like those CWC pieces. And Hoya made some great stuff back in the day. Uh, you might need to clarify a little bit more on this piece. I definitely, definitely don't know much about this reference at all, but great seeing it on. I think he said this was a Phoenix NATO strap. No, what was it? Oh, I can't remember. I must also say that when you guys send in your photos, you generally attach war and peace with it. <laughs> it's very difficult for me to try and like internalize. So you'll see it. Sometimes I put in brackets on the side, fiance or, you know, a key word to remind me of various things. Zane says, I should have told Russell we were doing another Rishot week. Oh, uh, don't worry. Uh, Russell sent in a great piece anyway, Zane. I, I didn't want it to be a show this week. That's the, that's the joke. I, it, this was just a, a sudden arrival and I thought, well, I don't, I'm not doing anything tonight. Why not just push this out? Okay, keep going. Thank you so much for this, Adam. Great seeing this piece and the layout and the placement. I definitely need to motor through these watches because I don't want this to be another three and a half hour show for all of you. <laughs> so this is from Alan and he sends in a Omega Seamaster 120. Love this shot. Nice dynamic use of the flowers. See how it works on the, the batons inside. Gorgeous looking piece. Again, I don't know too much about the, the timeline of this. If you don't attach a date to the watch, I struggle sometimes with uh, getting those details and saying, is it the five? Yeah, it is. It is the world time. Yeah, it is gorgeous, Zane. And we will be seeing it. Russell, since he is listed as R, you will see it. And it is a great story behind it too. I remember a few key points that he mentioned to me in the email. Um, love the symmetry of the dial, the balance. This is very much a mill spec inspired piece. This might have been used in the military. I really don't know, but it is stunning. And there's a few great Omega divers that we'll be seeing in the show, especially. One that was modified and one of the best modified pieces I've ever seen. So, Albert, call you that. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you, Albert. Um, so, the symmetry is great on the dial. Love the use of the loom. This is all tritium. Um, I would imagine this was probably a military issued piece. Don't see any T on the dial. Maybe that's just behind the hour hand. But the, the gradiated bezel, it's all clear. Gorgeous watch. And the photo is superb. I love this. We can be a bit more creative with our camera work at times. And it's always nice sharing this sort of stuff. And something, welcome. Great to have you here. And Michael, that is a nice piece. I've never seen one of these before. Seamaster 120. So thank you for this, Alan. Next is American Jedi. And he comes out strong with a 116500LN Panda that we all know. I uh, don't know where this was taken. I would imagine somewhere in Chicago because you're getting snow there again, I'm hearing. It's just insane. Uh, nice seeing it in the snow. I think he took it for a walk one day, chucked it in, ice cold, absolutely zen. Uh, always nice seeing a Panda. There's, there's one or two. I think there's only two, maybe three, three Daytonas for the show. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, going to keep running through. Thank you for this. And there's a few more from American Jedi. I love this one. I just titled it Homework. This says more than a thousand words right here. Having a son rocking a Seiko SKX and he must be what? Eight or nine, ten years old. No, not even. I'm terrible with children's names. But it's so good when a youngster gets into the hobby at this age. I mean, geez, I got into the hobby when I was in my 20s, you know. So starting young, absolutely BS. So good seeing this, you know, and we've got a Hulk 116610LV. Oh, I'm terrible with my references, but nice seeing a Hulk on the show. I think there's a few more actually. So thank you for this American Jedi. I think there's a few more coming up. This was a great shot. Nice seeing some, some background ambiance, some flames, got some contrast, got the panda on show. And I want to get to you in the chat. I see Dear Artifact. Great having you here, brother. Your watch is definitely featured. I am... Um, I stopped the, the, the submissions, I think, at about 5 or 6 o'clock this evening. Zane, you were the last person I saved, and that was it. So Zane always has to be last, and it's great seeing what he shows. That's always nice. Um, welcome to the lifelong addiction, kid. Absolutely, Chai Tom. Uh, it's so funny. Anyway, so this panda is great. It really is growing on me, you know. Um, I'm internalizing what I would get if I wanted one Rolex for the rest of my life. And I did, oops, oh no, I've just spoiled the surprise. 
And the and the panda for me is one of those references that I think I could wear very easily. The the white dial's great. I've quite fair skin. Anyway, yeah, Zane, I definitely didn't want to advertise the show. It's it's just it's just amazing because <laughs> I didn't want it to become a main thing tonight. I wanted it to be quite underground and subtle, but it's just you know the influx was intense. And uh, the thing is, after having a hundred, you don't really want to advertise that you want more sent in. So <laughs> anyway. Thank you for these American Jedi. And next is Antonio. And this is a special photo, and many of you might know why. This is taken in my hometown. So great that you're listening to me. The chat is, is slow enough that I can keep up. That's fantastic. So this is Cape Town. And you can tell because of that big rock in the background. That's called Table Mountain, for those of you who don't know the southern tip of Africa. It's the weirdest, weirdest thing, like natural. Ge ge geographical, geological change over time. I think it's sandstone. Don't crucify me. I'm by no means a geologist. Tafelberg, absolutely. Uh, lion's head should be over here in the distance, far, far away. Anyway, so really nice. And this is a Yima chronograph. There's a couple of these on the show. I think James, founder of Time is Capital, sent in one as well. Uh, so Antonio is based in Cape Town, which is always a treat. And it's nice seeing a well-worn chronograph. And the dial design on this piece, it reminds me, always reminds me of Day of the Dead, Mexico. Uh, it's, it's got that, that skeleton face mask sort of effect, you know? You know, Rey Mysterio, whatever you wanna, whatever you wanna assign it to. And just the accents, you have the reds, the blacks, the whites, it all works well together. Great seeing this piece. And yeah, seeing it worn, seeing it worn and used, it's always a treat. So Antonio, thank you for sending this in. And Shane said, I haven't been in Cape, Cape Town for 35 years. And the place has changed in the last 35 years, I would say. <laughs> Aldea de los Muertes. Thank you, Shy Town. Sugar Skull. So thank you, Antonio, for this. Next is Ashley. See, I definitely don't want to delay. I want to actually run through these shots a lot faster this time around because I realized after last week's show, when it's a three-hour show, it gets a little bit heavy, you know? So... Uh, from Ashley, this is a Hamilton Mill spec car key. Uh, the reference is 46374B. Don't know if that's just the stocking number or all of those details. Carassus, you're not late. We've been running for, what, 15 minutes? What, no, 19 minutes at this point. Um, great looking piece. And you can see that this is, in fact, mill spec because we've got a little, a little radiation symbol here. We've got an H3 over here. You can see the hands have patinaed over time. So an original Hamilton, I would imagine this was issued in and around the 80s, I don't know. You might need to clarify that a bit more in detail. Again, most of you send war and peace to me, so it's hard for me to like put together little bits and pieces. Most of the time it's me just saving, moving to the next, saving, moving to the next. Every single one of these, generally you always have to have your photo renamed to, uh, yeah, anyway. Great, thank you for this, Ashley. It's nice. I'm, I'm impressed that we got into the show so fast. Uh, as, as usual, normally, normally it's a very slow process, but we're already on to B, I think. Amazing. Okay, so next we get a submission in from, it has a radioactive sign on, is that radium? Carassus, I don't think so. A lot of these military watches, depending on the time period, they mainly just did it. Instead of having T on the hallmark indicating tritium, uh, they would they would highlight it just with this little rads mark. So I would imagine this is a tritium dial. And, you know, as, as we know, as the time periods changed, uh, tritium is a lot less volatile than radium as a substance. So I'd imagine this was just uh, their, their variant, the American variant of indicating that it did, in fact, have a uh, isotope on the dial. Um, you need to correct me. I'm definitely, H3 is tritium. Thank you, Eric. You definitely have to correct me in a few of these things. Yeah, I've been having a busy week, by the way, ladies and gentlemen. There's a video coming out in the next two or three weeks that I think you will all enjoy. It's military related, and yeah, it's it's going to be good. I'm taking a lot of time off to prepare it, so let's hope it's a winner. 20 minutes for each, le each letter of the alphabet. <laughs> we'll be here a while. <laughs> uh, but no, I, uh, oh, geez, you're right, by the way. I mean, geez, we just, we just finished A. Okay, I have to speed through these. Uh, the case size is 36. I would imagine, I would imagine it is. And Stephen asking, how is everyone doing? Hope you're all well. Absolutely. I didn't even address that in the beginning of the show. 
just want to say hi to all of you and thank you for joining. And I really hope you're all well, looking after yourselves, your family, and keeping yourselves busy. This is a time when we get to escape a little bit from the world, be a bit more creative, uh, pick up a new hobby, possibly, whatever else. Okay, sent in from Ben. He might be in the chat. This is a 1982 constellation, Manhattan. And I mentioned last week in the previous show that I was doing a write-up on the constellation. There's a few constellations coming up in this episode. And the, Man the Manhattan, the whole 80s era constellation needs its own video. So I do briefly mention in this constellation write-up that this variant will be getting its own video because there's a lot to talk about and just how the model has survived in the, uh, the sphere of constellations. It's amazing that Omega still offers this in their catalog now at this point. Tanzil, welcome, brother. Um, would the Seamaster Tribute 57 be a good watch to wear while eating bunny chow in downtown Durban? <laughs> yeah, I would say it would be because it's just unrecognizable. And I think the, the faux radium would also, it, it matches the, the color of the curry, wouldn't you say? That's fantastic. Tanzil, you're a wealth of knowledge, so you're always entertaining. It's great having you. Um, okay, Dylan, welcome. I've, I've said hi to a few of you. I've tried to at least. If you'd like to get a hold of me, just tag me in the chat and we'll get to it easier. Um, so again, this constellation, this Manhattan needs to have its own video and lots of little developmental details behind the scenes. I, you know, you can say that this watch looks pretty old school. It's dated quite heavily since the eighties, but a lot of these little details like the, uh, the integrated bracelet and case, it's a nice touch, the two tone effect, uh, the dial's gone cream. I don't know if that's how it originally was back in the day. Anyway, so we're going to carry on. Ben, thank you for this. And I think this is the same Ben who sent this in. The 2254. There's a few of these and one modified piece that is a mind blow. Uh, really great attention to detail. We'll be getting to it in the next, I would say the next 20 minutes or so. Okay. Final time is capital. I had one of those two-tone back in the day <laughs> talking about the constellation. Yeah, it was, a, it was a heavy hitter back in the day. I would imagine 80s in all the big cities, everyone wanted one, you know. Um, lines up with the date just from the time period. And I would imagine the, uh, the, the Rolex rare bird. What are they called? The oyster courts. That's it. Okay. So 2254, spoken about a lot. Great one of the best homages to uh, the MOD Seamasters of the uh, the late 60s, early 70s. I so wish Omega could bring one of these out again. If they just dug back into their roots, put a professional case with, with all of these components, just get that same aesthetic that they had. Possibly chuck the helium release valve. I don't think anyone really wants that. <laughs> uh, but keep the sword hands and even the wave dial looks great. Small detail like having the same color date window with the dial just lines up so nicely. Again, prepare yourselves for a superb modified variant of this in a second. And he also sent me a loom shot. That's, I mean, look at that. This watch came out in the early 2000s and still looks terrific today. So, uh, Mez9, thank you for joining. I hope I got your name right. I'm always, always trying. And Silverfish, thank you. Welcome, for welcome to the show. Great to have you here. Um, it's great that I'm actually motoring through this for a change. And Tim from Germany, welcome. I'm going to be jumping to and fro. Tetley, great having you here. Evan, it really is. It's a hidden gem. Uh, I think about six months ago, I did a write-up about this and, and compared it to the, the Seamaster of the 60s. I don't know. But I still firmly believe it is one of the greatest tributes to that original 300. And... The Planet Ocean, I would say, is the more modified variation. You know, it's it's evolved over time. It's got similar attributes, but this one has its own placing, I think. That's a great watch. Great amount of presence, subtle, understated. Okay, moving on. And we're now currently, what, 25 minutes into the show? Doing pretty well. This is from BH Legit. Didn't get his, didn't get his name in the, in the email. It's a 114270 from 2004. I don't know if this is an engraved rehort or not. Uh, the quality doesn't show that well, but you can see it's got an integrated bracelet. So it is, this reference is one of the last of this, uh, this line. I don't know how long the originals lasted, the 36 mil variants. Maybe someone can highlight that in the chat, uh, but it's just nice seeing a 36 mil piece. I've got a few explorers. There's never one show that goes by without an explorer featured. So it's always a laugh. Bear Koala, welcome. 
I would imagine you're from Oz. Williams watches, a 1530 and a 1630 are the rare birds, oyster courts. Yeah. They they are they are fascinating watches. And there's been talk about just how uh, how they are so collectible nowadays or you know, hype hype factor and and how social media helps push certain watches out. I can imagine the rare birds are gonna go up in value as time goes by. Because they are pretty special. I mean, oyster courts was a movement that was only made for those pieces. So of course you would imagine. Uh, they're going to have quite a long life behind them. Soda says, I think the manual helium release valve or helium escape valve is a signature design for Omega. They they may not put automatic valves on their watches like the Seamaster in the near future. Well, that's it. I, it is definitely one of their characteristics for sure. I mean, that's what really made the, uh, the Seamaster professional so quote unquote iconic in the 90s. It was one of those gadgets. I, I love that James Bond video that I did a few months ago, a couple of weeks back just talking about how the James Bond watch had these little details. So, uh, you know, you had lasers shooting out the bezel, you had bombs and everything integrated into it. So it is most definitely one of their details, one of their attributes at this point. And there was something mentioned, I don't know if it was a comment, but since Tudor and Rolex both have the helium escape valve as an integrated system, I feel like they own the patents to it. Uh, I don't know of many brands that have the same system with their watches. And maybe this is the best that Omega can do with this line. I don't know if it's purely design related, why they keep this here all the time, or if it's just because they don't, they aren't allowed to use a simple spring loaded system inside their cases. I don't know. Uh, it'd be interesting to know from anyone else. So BH Legit, thank you for sending this in. Next is from Cameron. And at first glance, I thought this was a Fortis, but the brand is Juinand. And it is made in Germany. It has a very German aesthetic. Looks like a Zinn, possibly. It's, it's hard to tell at first glance. I've never heard of this name before, but really like seeing this aesthetic. This layout is classic. You've got your orange highlight. You've got your typical Flieger style dial layout. Okay, and I saw mention from Julian saying the original done by Doxer. Thank you for that. Um, I'm talking, I'm actually doing a write-up on Comex Rolex, which is a part of this bigger video that I'm working on currently. And it's it's crazy seeing just how how far watches developed in the, um, the 60s and 70s. That was really the peak time when brands were just going out of their way to push the boundaries, you know? Wristwatch experience, welcome. Great having you here. Uh, let's see who else. This is great. There's banter going on in the chat. Has a Fortis vibe. Exactly. That's, a, that's what I thought very first when I looked at it. It's great that there's chat going on in the, in the chats at the moment, so I can just pay attention to this. And moving on. Thank you for this, Cameron. Nice seeing the, the green highlight. That's cool. Nice looking piece. This is from Carlos, our man in Panama. And he's just picked up a Doxa sub. So he's on the bike watching Bill Sanders as he is going through his show. And these Doxa subs, it needs a video. This watch deserves a video. Whether you want the orange dial or you want the yellow dial, it is such a character. It's all sorts of little details that I think is interesting. How the bezel integrates the, the minutes with the feet and the depth. So you can basically judge how long you need to decompress on the bezel by looking at your distance in meters, I think. That's it. Your, your time, so time is relative to your de decompression stops and by no means a, a decompression diver. I don't know much about Heliox and all of that stuff. So maybe Eric Bell can mention this more in the chat. But when you want to dive watch, you want something that is extremely legible, that is that stands out very well in, in the depths. I think yellow, orange, those accents makes it a lot easier to see at a glance. Would yellow and white be the best combination? It's difficult to tell. Yellow and black, fantastic. Yellow and white might be, it's a little bit of a clash. You can see that the white sort of blends into the yellow a bit much. I think orange is a bit more effective with this color scheme. But yeah, everyone, th this has become a cult watch on this platform for sure. Um, enthusiasts love this piece. And I mean, what's not to like this watch? They're, they're by no means cheap. They are pretty expensive, but they've got an amazing history. Jacques Cousteau was one of the, the poster boys with this watch back in the day. All of those divers and explorers of the time. Um, so, Founder Times Capital, you also have one. Yeah, it's just terrific. And Amur, I'm sorry. Amur, I'm sorry if I missed it. I've 
you know, I, I pretty much cut off the submissions by Saturday <laughs> and I did not project that this was going to be a show. I wanted to keep it quite low key and underground because I had over a hundred uh, watches sent to me by Monday. <laughs> so the worst thing is asking for more uh, when you, you know, just, just for details sake, I put the premiere up 24 hours before the show begins. So Friday, Friday night, I put it up prior to the Saturday show. And I got 70 emails over the course of that time. So you got to know, <laughs> this show is basically running by itself at this point. It's just great. I love, I love this shot uh, with the barbecue. It's cooking all sorts. We've got some green peppers. We've got some pineapples. This man knows how to eat. So thank you, Carlos. Great to have this. And next is from Cedar Canoe. Cedar Canoe sent in a whole load of his vintage chronographs. And I'm just going to slowly run through them. Um, Bear Koala, did I get? I'm sure I did. I must have gotten your email. If you sent it to me before Saturday, I probably would have saved it. Um, and if I do miss it, it will be featured very early on the next show, or it will be a part of the next show. That's kind of how it happens. There's always a Shaitan saying, Bri. Bri has two A's, Shaitan. It's, it's B-R-A-A-I. <laughs> I uh, deliberately left that out because no one knows what a Bri is. It's a uh, South African expression for barbecue. Anyway. Seiko Speed Timer, we've seen this piece before. Bullhead chronograph, love the, the caramel, the tobacco burst effect, the, the brass styling of the subdials. It really is an attractive looking watch. The bullhead aesthetic is definitely not it for everyone, but it is just clear character of the 70s. And we will be seeing a few more. So this is next from him. This is a citizen bullhead. I think we featured this on the show last week. Not, not sure. Flip and Zippo, thank you so much for the donation. Uh, it's a pleasure. Let's get the ball rolling. <laughs> well, we've already hit C, and we've got lots to go. If I just scroll, if you look at the left-hand side of the screen, holy smokes. It always blows me away just how many watches are there. Okay, we're, we're gunning. We're doing well. We're uh, 30 minutes in, and we're still rolling. So uh, Citizen Bullhead, love the contrast. We've got a panda aesthetic, and the real typical detail of the 70s, late 60s, the, the orange highlights. That really is the element that ties all of those pieces together from the time. Uh, sunburst dial. And look at this integrated case. I mean, this was right in and around the time of the, the Speedmaster Mark II, which I think is going to be on the show as well. Uh, really nice. 2 a.m. finish, Julian. <laughs> if you're based in the UK, the aim is to be to finish at 1 a.m. So, uh, judge your time accordingly. I think I'm running on GMT plus one time. I still don't understand how the Northern Hemisphere works its time zones. It's just, just confuses me. <laughs> Southern Hemisphere, time doesn't change, you know? In the North, you gain one hour, lose an hour. Uh, it's just throw it up in the air, it's a gamble. Cedar Canoe again. This is a leisure, I think. I could not see the, the L or the D or the F, or whatever this might be. I'm saying le jour, or is it a de jour? Someone please tell me what this brand is in the chat. But it's got an Inca block movement. Uh, really like the small details, like the highlights on the dial. This really reminds me of, of a vintage Breitling, possibly, a B01, would that be the reference? Um, really nice, simple, basic. Oops, Magic Mouse uses distressed straps. He, yeah, he loves his vintage chronographs, and he just, as we keep going, you'll see more and more leisure. Okay, great. That was a good guesswork from my side. Thank you, Bud Owens and Orange Hand. Great having you here as well, and thank you, and something. Uh, nice, see, nice fade of the tritium on the dial. Great contrast, great highlights and accent. So moving on to the next. This is also from Cedar Canoe. And again, don't know this name. Dugina? Dugina? <laughs> I you know I am so behind with all of these names. Every time I think I'm on top of things, so I I lose time. I lose I lose what I know. Um, great use of contrast between the khaki strap, the uh, the mocha brown, the the coffee brown. Great looking effect, and you see those red accents and those highlights all around the dial. It's exciting. Really nice combination. I don't know if this is tropicalized or if this is how the piece originally came. I really don't know. And a uh, unique color combo. Yeah, absolutely. I've never seen this. Maybe this was aged in the sun from the UV. No idea. You can, you can tell me. Uh, this is all new territory for me, for sure. Moving on. This is also from Cedar Canoe, and it's a Movado Datum. 
Datron, no, Datron, excuse me, Mafado Datron. Uh, wow, I didn't even notice this. Check where the date complication is. That, that is interesting. Now, why don't brands do this? Uh, I would imagine because you've got the chronograph hand in the way, it's difficult to see the time when, or, or the date when you have a single figure. But when you're working with doubles like 10 and 11 and 12 and 14, hmm, I like this combination. And again, the Panda aesthetic he likes, he's got a cushion case styling. Uh, the Datron, I don't know if this was a quartz movement or not. You might need to highlight that. There's some crazy watches. We'll be seeing Hamilton Electromatics or Electronics just now. And all of these watches have these crazy hybridized movements that are worth sharing. So it's a Movado Datron. Thank you, Bud Owens. I see a DAT, but uh, I don't know. And this, I don't know if that's the frequency, the MHS something something 60. Yeah, I am by no means a watch expert. I just like looking at the details. And uh, yeah, so thank you for the Seal Canoe. Another one from, from you, sir. Another Seiko chronograph. I have no idea what reference this model is. Uh, great contrast between the bezel, the dial, brass. Once again, it's almost like the 70s. Look at those hands. I mean, that handset is just 70s at its finest, you know? Uh, models, so many families. It's almost, I'm, I'm not wrong in saying this, I hope, that so many companies just outsourced their parts at this point in time. So they really didn't know which way was up. They, they pretty much sourced out what was going to be the, the correct handset dial movement and just put it all together. Even the bodies and the cases were all custom made and just thrown into a parts bin and assembled. So this is called a Kakumi. I have, thank you for this, Eric. I am not a, uh, a Seiko nutter for sure. <laughs> But uh, it's, it's an interesting looking piece, definitely a, a model of its time. And now finally, we're going to be jumping to, oh, he's got two more that he sent in. First is a Zenith El Primero, and it's an automatic. Again, another 70s era piece. He loves these watches. I can't imagine how many pieces he actually has in his collection. Um, not, and this is interesting. When we look at the, the dial, this was how Zenith used to illustrate their dials with their transitional pieces of the 70s and 80s. I've seen this, this layout before with the, the logo. I don't know how best to describe the logo. Almost looks like sound waves or reverberations that you would see in water. I really don't know. Have a good look at that. But we don't see a, a, a star on the, on the hand at all. And being an automatic movement, I would imagine this is the same movement that we see in the A384s, the A386s. Uh, very simple, great monotone dial. Absolutely, doc, Dr. J. Uh, very subdued and it doesn't look like a zenith at all which i think is it's also really nice to have a watch that doesn't have all those key characteristics of its brand sometimes that you can just wear and no one knows only you do um so what wristwatch experience that all steel model in c case only came in a thousand units i don't know if you're talking about this or if you're talking about the the seiko yeah i mean it's just never ending and also from cedar canoe i need your help here it's a Speedmaster. It's a professional. It looks pretty old. And I have no idea what year this model came from. What I do see is it has the old school applied logo on the dial. So you need to help me out here. Dot over 90, I know is one of the details. This looks like it has a dot over 90. Is this a 321 caliber? And are we talking late 60s, early 70s? This is pre-861. Let me know what this model is just so i could tell everyone a 145 looks like a 67 okay well that's great uh, if anyone else if anyone else has any good guesses on what this piece is please mention in the chat because i have no idea me me with speedmaster references and daytona references i am absolutely useless because it's it's bad to say but they almost feel all like the same but they have small little details that you can highlight and tell the difference. I've tried on all of these as well. I've tried on Ed White's, tried on an original 57, but for the life of me, I can never tell which is which. So um, let's have a look. So there's talk that it looks like a 67 from Joe. So this is a pre-moon pre -moon model, right? And it does have a 321, so it's quite an interesting piece. It's been worn, it's been lived, well, it's lived a good life. And uh, yeah, Cecilia Canoe, thank you for sending these all in. It's just great. But so many watches. I definitely would prefer if you guys sent in one watch from each because having to save like eight at a time can be quite difficult. I've had to 
do some culling in a few places because the watches get it gets a bit heavy at times with the amount of submissions. Next, this is from Sevi. We were introduced to Sevi in his 2CV wearing a two-tone Zenith Daytona. And today he sends in a Reverso GMT eight-day power reserve. And I, I hope I got that reference right. But what's great, when I receive a Reverso, the best thing is that you get to see both sides. So I really hope in future, if anyone wants to send a Reverso, if it does have a second side, please send both sides in. And also, this is such a great shot because we get to see the, the perlage at the back. We get to see the finishing. This is a beautiful dial. I actually prefer the black dial to the white dial. Is that wrong for me to say? <laughs> this is more, of course, this is more classically inspired. It's more traditional. But this looks just the business. This is really a monster. It's a great looking watch. I don't know. I mean, this complication alone, the, the level of detail, I don't know if this is stainless steel or if it's if it's white gold. But I, I just think that the added complications, getting two watches in one is something really special. You've got the date at the corner here. You've got your sub seconds. And you've got a moon phase over here at the side. Another thing that he wanted to highlight is that he is currently taking the wrist shot next to a 1929 Dabri, I'm going, to, I'm going to butcher this, by no means French, a Dabri Parvo K, 35mm uh, movie camera. So from 1929, this is a really, really old real spinner. And I'm guessing that the lens is facing, it's very hard for me to tell in this shot, but over here we get to see the layout. I don't know if, <laughs> if you guys know anything about cameras, vintage movie cameras. And here's another shot. I think we get a better idea of the lens. I think that's the lens on this side. I don't know. But Sevi looks like he has quite a taste for the old things. He drives a 2CV. He, uh, he rocks vintage cameras. He probably collects a lot of old things. So it's, it's nice. Us enthusiasts, we always have an addiction to old things, I think. Uh, or just collecting in general, you know. The style is simply gorgeous. I, I would buy this watch just for the style alone. I uh, think it's superb. Also on a black strap, it's great. So thank you, Sevi, for this. Next is Shaitan. Shaitan is in the chat. He's just commented. So he, so this is called the HMT Janata, and his caption was India's answer to the Timex Marlin. <laughs> I found that quite entertaining. Can't say I've ever seen this piece before in my life. Great to see some culture in this uh, in this series. Nice shot as well. If you want to tell me what the flowers are in the background, Shy Town, I'd love to know. Um, but otherwise, great seeing the symbols and the figures. And I mean, we don't ever see, I don't know what script this is. Someone would like to mention that to me. Uh, nice looking piece, really nice layout. Hard to explain. I mean, it's the, the amount of how symbols are used on dials. When you look at the true Arabic dials, when you look at Romans and batons, it's amazing to think that over the years, the amount of scripts that have been incorporated into, it's Hindi, thank you for that. How these scripts have been incorporated into dials over time. And you can see some similarities, like you can see that there is a one, because you see it next to the 12, the 11, the 10. That looks very much like a nine. That looks very much like a two and a three, four. Well, that's, that's actually a, that's a five. That's amazing. I mean, you can learn so much about script. I have a few friends that, that literally study script from ancient periods. And uh, it's always good to see just how it has evolved over time around the world. So thank you for the shaitan. I hope you're still there. Next, this is from Chris. And I think he's based in Utrecht. Uh, it, this, this is called a, let me just, I'm going to butcher this name as well. Gorgeous looking dial. It's a harboring two or a harboring squared. It looks like a squared to me, but you can let me know. What a stunning looking dial. This is a jumping second. So this is a mechanical watch with a jumping second hand. Looks so much like, I would say, a field watch from the 40s. Uh, so nice seeing that layout. The 36912, it's just a classic. You get that vintage rail dial. Harboring 2, thank you, and something. And I probably butchered that name as well. I should add a bit more, a bit more Austrian to my, my accent. And those are African daisies. Thank you, Shaitan. So we have a matte dial, great finish. Also really like the, the idea that this line, this, this center ring connects with the batons on both sides. You have the rail dial, the, the rail uh, minute track at the back, and then you have the center 
circle that connects everything up. It's really neat, ties it all together. Might be you might lose your your eye line a little bit. It might be difficult to catch the where the hands are because everything is just so symmetrical. You know, another detail, lefty. Thank you, wristwatch experience. It's it's a left hand watch, which is fascinating. So he loves wearing watches on his right wrist. And next to this, I, I think he told me a story that that he sent it in for a service and he got given a, a free strap with it and a titanium case. I think he had the watch. What happened was the stainless steel variant that he had was very heavy. And he sent this back to them and they gave him a titanium replacement <laughs> and a strap and the whole detail. So, yeah, amazing. Some of these companies, the lengths they can go. Look at the, I love the numerals as well. The nine, the 12, really get a good sense of attention to detail. Some serifs on them, you know. Great. Very vintage inspired. Nice piece. Next from Chris, also his submission. It's a lefty big pilot, IWC. And when you're going big pilot, I think the, the best models are the ones that have the simplest dials. Uh, it's definitely a model that, ha that has gotten a lot of attention and appeal the community loves. Um, it's not up everyone's alley. I would imagine this is 44 mils, possibly, maybe. Don't know. But the symmetry is superb on this. You have your sub seconds on the right. You have your power reserve on the left. You've got your, your main date at the base. Very easy to read. Nice balance huge crown that digs in. I mean, this is the one detail that I don't, I, I can't imagine what it must be like having a crown digging into your hand. Mention from, from MR, MR, sorry, I'm gonna, bot, I'm gonna bot your name all the way through that you love the crown. Love the detail, I must say, it really is something special. Uh, it's one thing about crowns from this time period. And speaking of which, talking about German watches, we will be, again, I'm doing a big write-up on a certain branch of the military over the next few weeks. I hope to have it finished in two weeks' time. And amazing bit of history. So it's going to be great to share it with you. Spent a long, long time researching it. The information is so sparse. It's so difficult to find uh, information for this certain timeline from uh, this various this country. Uh, but it's going to be nice highlighting it all and going through the, the timeline with all of you. So final time is capital, loving, loving wearing a, a big pilot. Watches at the moment for a change. Is that what you're wearing at the moment, James? That's fantastic. Yeah, there's, there's so many little bits and pieces. The band looks cheap from Omax. I mean, these, these hide leather bands, I don't know much about the, the type of material they use, IWC, um, but the rivets. The reason why I was mentioning my research and the write-up that I'm doing is that the rivet strap has been such an important detail that's passed through over time. I'm working on a write-up on the Lawrence of Arabia Omega, and it's almost as if it was an afterthought back then in the 19, in 1915 when they were doing this, and how it's transitioned now into the modern day, that's just great. So Chris, thank you for sending these in. We're gonna keep motoring through from Colin, and this is a gorgeous dial. Oh my goodness, 9411. I can't believe I actually said 7411 in this week's video. I did a review for Thomas, Thomas in Paris. And I said 7411, very absentmindedly. If you don't know that this is a 9411 snowflake, what are you doing, man? <laughs> uh, look at the detail. I love it when we get to see some macro focus on the snowflake hands, the numerals, everything is just nice and clean. Great story about a original uh, snowflake that we'll be seeing just now and how it's worn it's lived a great life we'll be looking at that in a second looks great right dear artifact yeah it's, it's stunning uh, one thing the, the element that really sells this watch to me i think that reflection on that hour hand i mean it looks like custard hey eh? it's like just so glazed it's amazing of course it's not actually the, the tritium that's shining it's the metal but it looks like it's a glazed hand yeah it's a great shot and these watches the, the thing that made these pieces so unique from Tudor when they were being issued to the military, et cetera, et cetera, is that their watches weren't recased. They weren't tested. They weren't regulated. They were sent from the shelf to the, the armed forces that they were being sent to compared to brands like Rolex and Omega who made specific pieces for military uh, regiments. Tudors were good enough that they could actually be used all their lives and still keep amazing time just with generic ETA movements, you know? Great bit of history there. I think I need to talk about that more in the, the military video that I'm working on. So yeah, 
custard cream loom looks great and the, and the fade as well just just saying that from from bud uh, the bezel fade is superb it's almost like a lavender purple we wouldn't call it blue it's gone like a lavender a lavender color the dial is immaculate as well if i'm not wrong these dials were prone to getting all kinds of corrosion and and fade over time because of just how water got into the cases anyway thank you for this colin gorgeous shot please send more of these in the future next from daniel an explorer one 214270 cannot go one show without an explorer featured and it's great it's like the it's like the staple watch of the series you know uh, it's either an explorer one or two or whatever else whether it's a pre what would you call it pre-vintage or neo-vintage or modern whatever else this one is nice because he not only sent the wrist shot but also a bit of loom so we get to see it in full action i think that's always a treat seeing the watch ablaze and i'm just referring back to the chat i'm getting better at reading the chats and catching up with all of you while i do this so black, black bay should have snowflake dial like a pelagos yeah i mean i agree and something they should at least have a variant that is similar you know they should at least have a variant of the black bay that uses both snowflake hands and a snowflake dial it would bring in more people i would say it would bring in more enthusiasts and omax saying this is the first rolex to have yeah i agree it is a terrific watch. And you know what's strange? I don't know if this is honeymoon period talking, but the more I look down at this, this 57 Omega that I'm wearing, I'll just pull it up again. Is it easy enough for me to reach? I think it is. The more I look down at this watch, the more I say to myself, I'm actually really happy that I got this over an Explorer. Is that bad to say? I don't know what it is. I think it might be the fact that I've just seen so many Explorers over time. And I, I just wanted that little X factor, something slightly different. It has it has the aesthetics of the Explorer, but it doesn't have the polarizing Mercedes hand. Uh, it's just so legible. I, I make a, a, a stupid comment. I, I enjoy um, Instagram because I bring out these ridiculous comments and I say, uh, the dial is just too legible at this point. I mean, you can tell time to the minute because of these elongated tracks that run around it. And you know, even, even though I say that, I still, one day hope to pick up an explorer it's a great watch I, I really think it's nice but it's too basic for what i want at the moment i mean i needed a bezel and all that anyway we can talk about the seamaster in a separate video i think in the future this watch is just as as far as rolexes go it's a watch you wear when you don't want to scream that you're wearing rolex and um i think that is that says a lot uh, you get to enjoy it but many people uh don't know what it is it's just a watch and uh, yeah all sorts of little details i think this this piece will always be timeless it's amazing how it has transcended its its time and we must also remember that this piece was introduced uh what the originals we're talking 55 56 57 kind of era as well and this watch is still going strong so yeah i mean i mean history you can pretty much refer back to the 50s for all design inspiration began too basic the buganish how dare i yeah no i mean i say stupid things on this channel sometimes <laughs> i really love this this is uh, obviously from a wedding of his nice to see that engraving and we don't we don't see many engraved case backs on the show so it's it's great to see a bit of a commemorative highlight here and uh, so thank you for this daniel always a pleasure seeing this and what else did he send <laughs> he sent this to me yesterday i think and his his caption was so this is a 5196 rose gold beautiful shot i i struggle so much with thinking about a thumbnail for the page and i was so close to using this um it was just a bit too dark and i couldn't get the light but this is a stunning stunning photograph you got the lighting perfect you got the the, the flatness on the wrist perfect uh, you get to see every little detail on it so 5196r entry level quote unquote Calatrava he doesn't wear this watch a lot and he's actually considering selling it so interesting to see how that goes but we we spoke about the I think there's another one in the show today uh, we spoke about just how they they deal with details on this piece it's spare it's it's very it sands a lot of detail but then you go in and you look at the the hobnails all around the dial they really don't scrimp on those details Patek Philippe I mean it's a timeless watch it is such a character of the brand the one watch and never sell as as charles says i think it's a piece you should keep daniel this this comes from a few of us i'm sure it's it's an heirloom 
this is a watch that you engrave and you give to your son, possibly. Uh, you know, it's it's one of those pieces that last you forever. And it is, oh, it's, it's a beautiful thing. Small, simple dress watch you could wear anywhere and force yourself to wear it, Daniel. I know it's difficult. Uh, you might not find the right occasion to be wearing a watch like this. But just say to yourself, this week, I'm locking away the watches that I have. Put them in a place where you're not going to go back like, into your wardrobe. Don't do that because you will obviously pull them out and have a look. Uh, put them somewhere where you'll forget about them and just wear one watch. Wear this for a week, maybe two weeks. Enjoy it. And, you know, it's, it's a very intimate piece because it's manual wind. So you get to really appreciate those, those small little, you know, elements from that time period. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's a beauty. It really is a classic. And shout out saying a grand classic. Yeah, I mean, it is. It's the one. I really hope Archie Luxury keeps his. This, this is the one Patek that I really hope remains in his collection. I know he loves to buy and sell his Pateks, but this one needs to stay. 5-1, I think he has it in G. I don't think he has it in R. 5196G. One of the best photos of the show, I think. Absolutely stunning. And one of these days, I will have a highlight reel of the best submissions, the best photos we've seen of these pieces over time. I was just going to literally send you my pick of that Patek, Marco. Yeah, I mean, Marco, it's it's ridiculous. Sometimes we get three of the same, uh, like, longer. We have, we've got two two Saxonia thins in one show. Uh, it's it's incredible, the variety that we've been seeing over the last few weeks running the show. Okay, I've got to carry on here. Wish I had a clear case back. I agree, Ant. It's one detail, or at least an officer's case back, so you get to enjoy the movement, you know? Okay. I said G, didn't I, uh, Chaitan? I mean J. It's 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 uh, yellow gold. Okay, from Dean. Now, here we go. This is going to be a goodie. Dean sent me an, an email with a simple description. So I'll let you read this for a second. Omega Seamaster Plan Pro, he calls it. Base, 20540, and it's a 300 meter movement. 300 meter, is that the caliber? I, I think so. That's the caliber. Upgrades, bracelet from a Speedmaster. Clasp from the new Seamaster Professional. Dial with applied indices from a Seamaster Professional. Bezel crystal second hand date wheel from a Planet Ocean. Are you ready for this? This has got to be one of the best modifications I have ever seen. And here we go. So he's taken a 2254 and equipped it with Planet Ocean elements. The one detail that I've always said about the 2254 that doesn't Franken <laughs> uh, Omega mods. Yeah, I know. It's great, right? So um, the one thing I've always mentioned about the 2254 that I don't appreciate is the, the bezel insert. And there's some amazing modifications with the Planet Ocean bezel insert. And here it is. Here's an example. Beautiful. Such a great layout. You get everything that you want out of that mil-spec inspired piece. But then also it's, it's small. It's slim. Uh, and he's sent in a few more. Let's see if I pull up another shot. This is it in direct light. And you must check out the loom shot of this as well. You, I, I wouldn't, and there's a mention, can you call this a Franken watch from Omax? You probably can, but since he's using OEM Omega parts, it does also mean that it is, it is a part of the catalog in a way. Are you ready for the loom shot? I mean, that, that is just amazing. It doesn't look like a 2254 at all. It has, has an X factor to it. It's something else. Uh, minute hand looks quite big. It does look pretty long. So I'd imagine that this handset came out of the 43 mil Planet Ocean, maybe. Um, but that dial, oh, I just love it. I think it's one of the most interesting uh, modifications I've ever seen on a Seamaster before. It looks great. Uh, nice and tapered, you know, tailored. Doesn't look oversized. Doesn't look like it's, it's, you know, look at the thickness of the watch on the wrist. Stunning. So thank you for this, Dean. Really nice seeing this. And uh, it's Omega Incest. <laughs> Shites on. That's great. So next is from Dear Artifact, who is in the chat. And Dear Artifact sends in some of the best photos of the show. The only reason why I don't feature Dear Artifact's photos as the cover is because I struggle. It's, it's, the, it's the positioning. If you send me a wrist shot, like, like how I position them normally, Dear Artifact, I'll be sure to have this on the show in the future or have any of these as a, as a cover photo. Your, your use of lighting, positioning, it's amazing. And let me just quickly... If you're in the chat, I am going to drop in his uh, Instagram handle. Follow him on Instagram. Some amazing photographs. 
the quality is just absolutely insane. So this is a Hamilton, everyone knows it as the, the khaki pioneer, I think, but we should just call it the W10 because that's that's what it's supposed to be linked to, right? The, the original W10 from the uh, MOD specification. And they make an amazing reissue. He sent a few. Look at that. I'm just going to rotate this. <clears throat> you get to see the texture on the dial. You get to see that case. There was a mention a second ago. Uh, Hamilton W10 is a great reissue. It's interesting, right, Thomas? It's uh, And the size and presence, I think this watch is about 36 mils on the wrist. So it's not too big, not too small. The cushion case adds a bit more uh, presence as it sits. Yeah, it's great. I don't know what Hamilton did with the movements. Uh, if this is an automatic or a hand wound, you might need to uh, might need to highlight that a bit more for me. Let me know. And uh, Neil says, "Nice shot. Give give me some landscape shots." Yeah, you know, it's it's difficult. A lot of the time, I've never struggled with finding. Love this. He's got some got his child there on the screen as well. It's great. Uh, I, I've, I've never struggled to find a great shot to use as the cover photo. Uh, and this just recently for this show in something, for example, sent in a stunning picture of his uh, sector dial. I was so close to using it as we will get to it. You'll understand why yeah, it looks great. It looks great in your wrist as well. I love this. Dear Artifact takes some of the best photos. You can really get a good understanding of watch on the wrist from a distance. Wrist shots are great, but when you get to see uh, it from a distance and actually in context, you know, in profile with, with a sleeve, um, you get a better understanding of just how it wears on someone. And Zane send, saying, um, oh, to Charles, send in, yeah, absolutely. My email, my email's in the uh, description of this video, should be. No, it's not. Genius. Oh, it is. Uh, if you just go scroll down a little bit, you'll see in the description that the, my email's mentioned. Okay, let's carry on. So, dear artifacts, always a pleasure. Thank you for sending these in. Uh, there are some incredible shots. I love the way you use lighting. I don't know how you edit these, but the lighting, the effect that you get on all of the parts, the contrast, it's its an art form. Photography is a real art form. Okay, these came in from Delmar, and they came in today, I think. And you're going to need to help me here, ladies and gentlemen. I have tried to look up this name, Zapek. Zapek is the name of the brand, I hope. Apparently, it's a fairly new company. It hasn't been around very long need to clarify that with me as well, but it's a gorgeous looking chronograph. It has a guillochet dial. Uh, it's, it's so clean and interesting. Has has a very Parmigiani styling to it when you look at the hands. It's sort of semi asagai esque uh, We have serif, serif uh, numeral at the 12, uh, central date window. It's just so nice and clean. And I get right in and we have a look at the texture on the dial. Something amazing about proper machine guilloche, where you get to see this radial outburst, where, where it resonates from the subdials. You notice that the subdials are the focal points, and how it almost bounces off and, and goes around. It's like a vortice in a way. It's a Swiss brand. Thank you, founder. Um, and Shaitan saying Czech name, so I think it's spelled Chapek. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I am. I am by no means a pro with European languages at all. So <laughs> Chapek, Zapek, I, I saw I saw a, a presentation by, what was the uh, name slips me, but there was mention about the new brand and he said Zapek. So you might need to, <laughs> Zapek was, was the original founder of Patek, Wa, wa Potato. <laughs> I don't know if that's true or not. Uh, anyway, so he's got a rubber strap on this. So this is what he wears. Oh, and just also notice, look at the case, beautiful cutaway. Very much reminds me of a Parmigiani in a few places. Actually, I mean, this could even be a platinum. Well, I didn't even mention the name. It's it's a, called a FDC Panda Beau or Beau, and this this reminds me of a platinum. What's it? A five three seven zero from Patek. We have this beautiful cutout inside the case. It forms so nicely. Gorgeous, gorgeous looking watch, and the blue on silver is also stunning. So. I have no idea what this brand is, where it comes from, but it is definitely a niche brand. Uh, I also like the idea that we get to highlight watches that are just never spoken about at all. That's what makes these shows such a dream. And this this was his. This is his watch, okay? And hers, Parmigiani Floria Toric Hemispheres Retrograde. We've heard of Parmigiani in the Toric family, Toric Chronograph. I think uh, Prince Charles wears a Toric Chronograph crazy piece. Um, but this is great. So a retrograde, meaning that the seconds hand will return back to 60. 
Uh, we have a date complication that is spare of a window. It's nice seeing the date actually integrated into the dial. So you get to see a separate hand moving along with it. Uh, this looks like a GMT. So we've got a 24 hour, 24 hour hand time zone, sub seconds running at the base. Great looking watch. Imagine your wife wearing one of these. It's quite something, right? Real statement. And I don't know the material. It might be platinum, might be white gold. Parmigiani does make some great stuff. And I would like to feature more of them on the show in the future. If anyone has some Parmigianis, I'd like to learn more about them. It would be great to make that a cult watch on this page in the future. <laughs> um, yeah, so in indices similar to JLC, as Julian says, they do look very similar. I must say, the type, especially looking at the 12, the 10, you do see the typeface looks very similar. And also, look at the, the gorgeous fluting on the bezel. I think this, this style of fluting needs to come back. Vintage fluting, where it's very understated, and you only really notice it when you look harder and closer. This reminds me of a pocket watch, you know? Gorgeous. Next, from Doc Baps, he sends in, as always, we have to feature an Explorer 2 on the show somewhere. 216570 Polar Explorer 2. It's a darling on this page, or on this uh, platform, I should say. Everyone loves it. And, yeah, I mean, what's not to like about the Polar aesthetic? Uh, for those who don't know, I, I have critiqued this watch in the past. I have worn this. I wore it a long time ago when you could actually go into ADs and try on pieces. 42 mil size was just too, it looked visually too big on my wrist. And the one critique I had for this watch is the proportions on the dial relative to the bezel. The spacing, I just don't feel it is as tight as it could be. They just need to shave off a millimeter or two on the dial and they would have such an intact looking piece. But they did some great things with this model. Uh, beautiful 24 hour hand. Also, uh, Thursday, I put a video out on the Corey Richards Vacheron. That was a lot of, that was probably one of my favorite videos I've done in a long time. Short and sweet, just running through that piece unique Vacheron overseas. Highly recommend. I'll, I'll put it in the corner of the screen now if I remember <laughs> to come back and edit the show. Highly recommend you have a look at it because it is a stunning overseas. Uh, made of titanium. And it just reminded me because of the orange hand on this model and uh, great highlights. And yeah, it's a great watch. Really great every day. Another one of those pieces you can wear, flies under the radar. No one knows what it is unless you know Rolex and you, you, you're a little bit well-versed. Uh, time in the UK. Thank you for joining. Pleasure to have you here. And Zane, yes, your Vacheron overseas video was nice. It was cool. I really wanted to keep it short. I didn't want to spend too much time running into the details. So it was just a brief discussion around Corey Richards, who he is, and how this watch came to be. Great looking watch. And there was a mention in the, in the comments. I didn't get to them. But there was a mention saying that his name is engraved into the rotor of the watch. So why didn't he keep it? It's a 22 karat gold rotor of, of Everest. Oh, it's, a, it's a beautiful watch. Really one of the, I would say, one of the best functionally beautiful pieces out there nowadays. Um, and since it's a one of one, would be great to uh, see that expanded over time. Rich Buddy, great to have you here, sir. Thank you for joining us. Any quartz watches? Absolutely, Omax. We'll be seeing all sorts. There's, there's lots. I think this is a quartz piece already. So this is from Eric Bell, a Seiko Solar Diver Chronograph plus a 92 uh, Alvarez Dana Scoop. And there's, I, I didn't read your email at length, Eric, but uh, there was mention about how this cutaway actually cancels out the, the resonance or the feedback from the pickups. I can't remember the details you highlighted, but it is, it's a nice combination. And I didn't, I didn't actually share this guitar in more detail because there's just simply too many other watches to show. <laughs> so I've had to be quite sparse with my choices. I'm actually having to eliminate duplicates of photos. Um, but this piece, I mean, it's a brick. It's a real tank. You can see the, the bracelet construction. I can honestly say I have never seen a bracelet that has H-links connected up with a shark mesh. Fascinating. We always learn something new here. Coke bezel, got a chronograph. I must say, very integrated. Looks like the parts are well connected. And it's a solar diver. So not only are you dealing with a really high accuracy movement, but you're also dealing with one that powers itself. And this is a... Uh, Mecca Quartz, no, what, is it, what do you call it? A 9F Quartz, I don't know. I'm, I'm terrible with my references in these pieces. Um, okay, 
Let me carry on with you guys in the chat. I hope to catch up with you all. Next is from founder Timeless Capital, who's in the chat. And I, I ask him sometimes to send in some pieces. Last week, he sent in a gorgeous Mark 1 1680. And the way he collects, uh, he only gets one owner box and papers pieces. And he sent a nice selection of vintage Rolex sports watches. And this is one of a few. There aren't too many on the show. But we're going to enjoy it. So this is a 1675 Mark I dial. Uh, you don't often see black on black with these references. So they are quite interesting when you see them paired together. With a matte dial, you can see that the, the loom has had its time. You can see the loom has been applied. The loom has been applied quite shoddily. I don't know if that was just a thing back in the day. You know, everything was just... Everything was just thrown in. And the bezel fade, absolutely. Uh, that was, who mentioned that? Orange hand. We have a, a nice gray, a black to gray fade from the, the two o'clock all the way up until the midnight. Nice contrast. And we've got a few more. So let me just run through them. And again, all of these parts are original. James is quite methodical when it comes to finding watches that are, or his daughter is very methodical when it comes to finding watches that are clean and clear, no rubbish lots of uh, history behind it too so you get to have all the paperwork and the boxes next from him is a 5513 and i mean this what a gorgeous looking dial wears it on a nato like i think it should be these subs of this time period i mean this lines directly up with uh, watches of the uh, the armed forces and all of those so seeing it on a nato look at that dial and this is a serif dial if i'm not mistaken serif serif batons that must mean something Let's have a good look. If you look closer in there, you can see that the, this is actually a better example. You notice that the baton actually has small serifs on the back here. So might need a bit of clarity about, about this reference, uh, but it's just unique, cool. 5513 is a gem and a big domed crystal as well. It's great. Really, and the patina has aged. The, the, the actual numerals, indices have aged so well on the dial as well. So my daughter deserves the credit. She does, James. Absolutely gorgeous. Flat four. There we go. So flat form meaning, I'm thinking of Beatles now, um, flat form meaning that the, the 40 is in line with the bezel, right? And that was from Eric Bell. I don't know. You have to clarify. There's so many little bits and pieces on these watches that I simply don't know. The references just get greater and greater. Uh, this is a 14060M, and we know it's an M because it has four lines of text. The last hoorah. This is the the real neo vintage submariner that many people love because it had the upgraded movement i think they had just moved to silicon balance bridges at this point or silicone hairsprings I, I don't know i don't know if that's the right history but you can tell that it is one of the last because it has an engraved rehort ultra clean you can still get these watches in superb condition untouched you know uh, and Julian, your Beetle photo will be featured. Your 58, I'm so envious of you. <laughs> I have a 68, and uh, it, the 58, I don't, was that an oval or was that a split? Can you mention that in the chat? I'd like to know. I'm, I would imagine that the 58 was an oval window. Okay, I'm going to carry on. So again, this watch is just neat, clean, tidy, untouched. This one is a rare one, and, and James sent this to me after I'd saved all the other photos he had sent through. 57 was the last oval. Thank you, bud. Okay, so this is a 16710 fat serif bezel. We notice that the bezel has serifs, and there's it's the, the details, all of these little highlights on these watches that you just, that I, I don't pay attention to. Only the vintage collectors would know. But having a serif bezel is a big deal with this piece, and, you know, it's, it's very rare. There's only a couple of them in the world. And again, this one is brand spanking new. Is this bracelet, this bracelet's also original? I'm actually surprised. I would imagine this would be in a hollow bracelet, but that's, so this time period must have been about uh, late 90s, early 2000s-ish. That's just great. And what I like is that we not only see a 16710, but we also saw a 1675. These two watches are pretty much in line with each other. You know, uh, you can see how the styling changed over time. You can see how the, the indices changed. All the batons and plots, great. I really love the selection. This is all out of his, his box that he's currently holding on to since everything else is locked away. Bezel, exactly, blue shirt. Okay, keeping on. So this is also from James, and it's a 114060. We get to see the sub with its superluminova. 
It's a great, it's, I must say, the color scheme, the, uh, the blue that they've used. I don't know if this is right. I don't know if this is just marketing, but apparently blue is one of the last colors you see at great depths. So technically, you'll be able to see this bezel or, or the, the dial and everything glow longer at depth because of this color scheme. Anyway, GMT Christmas. <laughs> so thank you for this, James. And next up, there's a few more from him. This fits so well on his wrist. I think this is the last Daytona that we're going to be featuring. But this is just your standard black on black that everyone loves, the ceramic. Very versatile watch, if you can read it, you know, read the time. <laughs> I think that's important. Um, I, I would say the Panda speaks to me a little bit more. But if you want something more understated that you could wear every day without people uh, noticing what you're wearing unless they're into, into watches, I think the black on black is quite the character piece. And they did some great things with this model. One detail that I noticed is that the previous generations had polished uh, subdials. And what that would do is it would play, it would play well in, in the light. You would, you'd get to see lots of light play on the dial, but time telling would be so difficult. And the fact that they've actually matted these components now, the, the subdials, you get to read it a lot easier at a glance. It's almost like an off gray instead of this bright silvery champagne finish, you know? Uh, but Rolex and their text, I mean, they really go to town. <laughs> and you, you can understand why they did it. I mean, they're doing it just to balance out the, the subdial. They're trying to give it some form of symmetry, but it is very cluttered. But still, great looking watch. I mean, it is something else. Um, another detail I always like to point out to, to irritate those who have OCD, what made the zenith movements so awesome in these pieces was that there was clear symmetry from left to right. You notice that if you, could drew, if you drew a line from this plot across to this plot, you would have all the, the hands matching. With the Rolex movement, we see that the hands have actually been pushed up ever so. So there's a dip. You see it better with the panda reference, but uh, I always find that quite entertaining to highlight. And I'm sure that also was, I don't know if that was a movement constraint of theirs or if they were just trying to adjust the, the aesthetic ever so slightly. No idea. I don't know if they designed the, the face and the dial first before the movement. Who knows? Next, this is also from James, and this is your 116519. And this has to be one of the best contemporary uh, white gold Daytonas out there, just because it is so casual and Sundials. I'm, I'm saying subdials, I hope. I'm just not saying it slow enough. Subdials. Thanks, bud. Uh, the, the, the way you can wear this watch on a daily basis with the rubber strap, the, uh, the contrast between the bezel, the bright dial, uh, you wouldn't believe that this is a white gold piece, first impressions, until you hold it, of course. Um, and it is paying homage to the 6263, the, the big red. I think that's the reference. I am, or 6264. I'm useless with Daytona references, less less than useless. Uh, but it's a great looking watch. I mean, the, it's interesting how they've decided to fill in the subdials of this piece. And it's one, it's one aesthetic that really defines the modern Daytona is that they hollow them out, which essentially lessens the overall presence of the subdial on the dial. So you can tell the time a bit easier. Uh, you, but the problem is you lose that legibility. It's, it's more difficult to read the, uh, the subdials at a glance where if you have a full subdial, much easier to tell what's going on. So this is a much easier watch to use as a chronograph. Is time telling effective because of it? I don't know, you'd have to let me know. But the Oyster Flex is also nice. Uh, I don't know so much about strap changes. Apparently you can't, you can't change the straps on these watches because the, uh, the holes are drilled in a certain place. And this segment of the end link is fixed to the watch. I don't know why they did that. Quite a terrible move from them. Anyway, going to, oh, <laughs> you're correcting your chat. Okay, great. Um, and I haven't even mentioned, I haven't even spoken to you in the, in the comments. Uh, Charles saying always gold on Oyster Flex. Yeah, it's, it's very uh, understated. It's nice. I mean, when you, when you have a gold watch, it's great to, to keep it toned down, you know, visually. Okay, moving into the next and the last from Founder. Here's another Yima Rally. And we had one at the beginning of the show. So it's amazing how two of the same watch has been featured. This one, I would imagine, this looks like a reissue. Correct me if I'm wrong, this looks like a modern reissue of the vintage piece that we saw. And again, has that Day of the Dead aesthetic. Those subdials very much line up with 70s uh, car instrument clusters. We've got livery on the side here. It looks like racing stripes. 
he really went to town with uh, with this model and they are stunning i'd actually love to feature this on the show talk about the brand a bit more discuss the history and it needs a rally strap so as you can see if we move further in you can see some holes cut into the leather there you have to have a rally strap with this watch this one pretty much established the rally strap no and Mario Andretti, he I mean he was the the real ambassador for this. He won it. He won a few of these after his races at uh, Daytona, or uh, I don't know what other races he would be competing in at the time. Do the straps make the watch go fast? Absolutely, Joshua. So thank you, founder, for all of those. And next is from Frank. This is called a parallel again, a name that I do not know, but it has one of the coolest functions. It's called a, a parallel. A parallel, parallel. I'm going to say parallel, and uh, it's it's called the poker reference A four zero one eight. Great symmetry on the dial, and he says that this is a watch that he wears when he plays poker. Why? Well, it has a bit of a party trick. You notice as it's sitting now, non motion, you get to see the cards sticking up ever so slightly, but when you move your wrist, that dial moves away or it spins it spins with everything else and you get to see a nice play with how that little it's it's i don't know if it's an internal rotor i think that's what was was mentioned it's an internal rotor that's used to wind the watch and that rotor as it spins allows you to see all the cards on display really nice poker watch right get to see it good in that that highlight there uh ron the shrink welcome and junior johnson great to have you here Many of you are just joining us. We have currently been running for an hour and, what, 23 minutes or so. Pretty good. We're doing well. I'm actually motoring through this for a change. I'm not uh, delaying too much. <laughs> trying my best to interact with all of you, but also uh, keeping the show rolling. So a great amount of contrast on the dial. What's nice is you can actually tell the time pretty well in this piece. You've got whites and blacks. You've got reds as your, your high contrast. And then you've got all your cards inside there too, which also plays with the detail so it's a nice nice complication I can honestly never say i've seen a, a reveal like this there are a few watches out there that have these revealing effects to them anyway going to carry on thank you for this frank next is from gary and it's just your ground and basic p0220050 it this was the 2006 casino royal tie-in i think uh planet ocean so it's a 43 mil model Nice and simple, clean. Uh, it's a great piece. So I'm just going to leave this on the screen while I address you all in the chat. Another five hours to go, Zane. <laughs> yeah, I'm, uh, I'm going to try and keep it as close to three hours as possible. I know these shows go on for ages, but uh, what can you do? Uh, it's always a pleasure doing this. I wanted to keep the show under wraps, but, you know, word gets out and then everyone joins in. Um, so Ron the Shrink says, the bracelet and clasp on your CMOS 300 is phenomenal. Perhaps the best aspect of the watch. Thanks a ton, Ron. It really is. I, the, the, what I like so much about the piece was that it's all unique. You know, whether you're looking at the case, the bracelet, clasp, all these little details makes it its own watch. And there's talk about just how the bracelet is, the, the, and the links themselves are small, petite. I literally haven't taken this watch off for uh, a month, a month and a half at this point. Let me just pull it up again because I just enjoy showing it off. <laughs> I haven't taken this watch off for a month and a half and I just, I just does everything for me. It's at this point, it probably is honeymoon period, but what can I say? Uh, it's a great piece. And I've just forgotten the Yuma rally poker. Here we go. Gary getting better at this. I'm actually starting to uh, learn the system a bit more. I'm trying to integrate the uh, the live stream chat into the show. I think in future, I'm going to try and get it in a way that I can pull up your comment live through StreamYard while I'm presenting to you. Don't know how that's going to work, but anyway. Um, how are you finding the bracelet? Will you switch to a NATO? Zane, I actually switched to a NATO yesterday. I was playing around, and this watch looks stunning on a NATO, but I just threw it back on the bracelet again. The NATO just doesn't... Ah, the, both the leather and the NATO, I think, just doesn't really sing as well on this watch than the bracelet does. Uh, you want to keep it looking all original in that way. I'll share some photos in the future. I think I'll, uh, I'll take the bracelet off and put it on a NATO and share it with all of you soon. Um, Eric Seapop, welcome to the show. Magic Mouse Master. <laughs> Thanks for a swatch experience. Okay, going to carry on here. And um, final time is capital. I was talking to Thomas Burnett. Okay, let's catch up here. So this is from Guan Tom. And he sent in, wait for it, Speedmaster Professional, but not 
the man on the moon, <laughs> the, uh, the sapphire sandwich, which is something that we haven't, I don't think we've ever featured a sapphire sandwich on this, uh, this stream before in the series. Essentially, it's a sapphire crystal. And the bonus about having this version, it's a bit more scratch resistant, I guess. But what you also get is a clear case back. So you get to enjoy the caliber. And it's, it's that point of contention where it's nice having the first watch worn on the moon when you have that, that solid case back, but you also want to see it. One thing that's beautiful about a chronograph is you want to see the movement. And the, the Sapphire variant offers you that, which is something I think, I think is important. I think more Speedmaster chronos should feature that. Like the, the CK2988 or 2998, I can never get that reference. The... Uh, gorgeous looking watches but again all of them with solid backs where we enjoy we enjoy seeing movements on these pieces speedmaster professional you can never go wrong with this watch um, even someone who enjoys rolex explorers and all the rest for this as a first watch i think is just tremendous value for money uh, versatile you can wear this watch for the rest of your life it's your one and done chronograph which i think is important and barring the Rodania Geometer, which is a watch I like to bring up, this piece is completely unique. It has one of the best designed chronograph dials of all time. It is a design great. I think it's actually been featured in many design books, industrial design books, talking about its legibility and just where it sits. I mean, it is one of the most iconic chronographs of all time, if not the most. That's, that's a point of debate. It'd be nice to hear your, uh, your thoughts on that. I think when Omega was celebrating their Apollo 13 story a couple of weeks back, they sent an email saying the most iconic chronograph of all time. Open to debate. We can definitely discuss that. And thank you for this, Guatam. Uh, next is from Gavin, Nomos Club. He sent in a few pieces. This is a reference 701, 36 mil. And I know many people in the chat, Ron the Shrink especially, really doesn't appreciate Nomos in the slightest. I'd like to know why, Ron. It'd be great to hear your one line about what you think about this, this brand. Um, it's growing on me in a way, but I, I couldn't see myself wearing one of these pieces. The only one I really love is the Orion. I think simplicity is, is key. This piece, I think that the dial, like I say, the dial is what's growing on me with this watch. Um, perfect identity is when you say that this goes and, and is given to a university student, someone who's just started out in life, you know? Um, I don't know if this dial looms at all. It's this, uh, the red highlights on the hands. This doesn't look like Luminova. Maybe it does glow. I have absolutely no idea. But it's a, it's a simple sports watch. I mean, Nomos being an in-house manufacturer, great piece. Uh, just not up everyone's alley for sure. Fairly new company, of course. Truth is, they were only established in and around the 90s, no? 95, somewhere around there. Uh, and Zane, I'd rather have a Nomos over Swatch. I agree with you on that, Zane. Uh, Swatch to me is not a brand that speaks volumes. It's one of the first watches I ever had, actually, when I was, you know, single digits. <laughs> um, Nomos for art gallery snobs in turtlenecks. Shaitan, I think that's one of the best comments of the show. That is spot on. <laughs> art gallery snobs in turtlenecks. I can imagine industrial designers who don't know much about watches wearing this and say, yeah, uh, this, this is my jam. Anyway, moving on. This is also from Gavin. Sends in a date just, uh, 115210. I hope I got that reference right. But the bezel is the real character, the real uh, detail that we love. Engine turned bezel that we never see nowadays. It's one that, speaking about second, finding it on the, the gray market, they are easy to obtain because they just aren't desirable yet. They might be. Um, anyway, catching up with you all in the chat. It's nice that you guys are all just debating amongst yourselves. It's a nice looking bezel, right, Kenneth? Let me get right in and have a look at the, this is a good point here. Vintage fluting, man. Vintage, vintage fluting is, is just the way. Uh, I so wish more brands could pay more attention to that kind of detail. And uh, less is more. Well, there's lots of fluting on the bezel, but you see it from a distance, it doesn't look crowded, it doesn't look busy, and it's unique. I mean, Personally, I prefer a domed bezel on a watch like this, but in saying that, I think the uh, the effect is quite riveting. It's very unique to the Datejust. Almost looks like a turnograph, first impressions. So this was great from Gavin. And he also sent in a Tissot P0, PR50 from 98. 
and these watch were these watches were the, the talk of the town in the 90s i remember i mean everyone wanted these pieces right uh, very popular and again good value for money Tissot is a very very old brand i would imagine this is a quartz piece don't crucify me i might be completely wrong there but uh, the two tones are nice we get to see some uh, some roman numerals nice handset i'm going to catch up with all of you guys so thank you for this gavin Oh, here we go. And now we're jumping to the 5508. Here we go. Right. So let's talk about this piece briefly while I uh, address some of you in the chat what's going on. It's talking about date justs, uh, truth fears, fluted bezels collect dust and grime. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, truth fear. Um, I definitely don't want to say that the bug as a, as a word because that, that immediately just destroys what good you're trying to do on a video. <laughs> um, Okay, so everyone's just having a good laugh. So anyway, this is from, from Graham, and he sent this in, 5508. He picked it up in 1995 for $800. And why is that? Well, 5513s were too expensive back then. <laughs> oh, the irony. Oh, the irony. So this piece is by no means original. It's had a replacement dial, a uh, replacement bezel. Um, the case is in good condition. He didn't wear this watch much back in the day, but now he's enjoying it because he loves the, the presence. But I mean, this watch was made in 58, so you can't expect it to be all original. You'd be very lucky. I don't think it came on an original bracelet as well. And uh, he found a brilliant aftermarket that we will see in a second. Oh, it's, it's, a, it's a replica of the original rivet that we will see just now. Um, and this is on a Bulang & Sons suede strap. So this is just great. 37 mils, excellent amount of presence. And here's the aftermarket rivet that he's using. Also a stretch rivet bracelet. And it's just clear, simple. Uh, it's the, the dial, the actual, I mean, look at those numerals on the dial, the batons, the plots. It is so clean. I think the watch has been redialed in the past, but the, the patina and the age, it looks great. And how often do we see a, a 5508 on the show? Uh, it's just stunning. So moving through, we have a side view of the piece. We get to see the, the lugs and the flanks. Again, this has become more of a daily wearer for him at this point. Uh, he's enjoying it, and he likes to wear it quite often because of the size and the presence on the wrist. Next to the 5.5, he's got a Cartier tank. And don't crucify me with the reference. I would imagine that this was in and around the 70s. Oh, here we go. He's actually given me a, a good detail here. Oh, wow. So here we go. So a Cartier tank, Louis Jumbo, recently traded with Christian at Theo and Harris for my 1675 GMT. Interesting. Okay. So here we go. So what Graham did was he traded this watch for a 1675 that we will be seeing in a second. And it's called a Noblesse tank. I Thank you for that, truth years. Uh, don't, I don't, me, and, me and tank references. I would imagine this was a 70s, 80s era reference. Uh, does he want to double his money? I'll buy it. Found a time is capital on, on the 5508. By all means, I can give you his email if you like. Um, so I'm just trying to understand what he said here. He's traded this watch with Theo and Harris for a 1675. Well, he's, he's, he's highlighted it here as well. So we'll see it in a second. And uh, this is a gorgeous piece, Tudor Sub. And I think he traded uh, an original that he had for this piece. And this just looks great. I mean, you very seldomly see the Tudor Submariner with its white plots on the dial. This is a real snowflake. 7016 reference. No. Uh, really nice and clean. Great presentation. We get to see it really stand out here. Nice contrast. Snowflake dial. Snowflake hands. That's just the way it has to be, you know. Really nice presentation here as well. That looks like, I see a single pusher. That's a Glassut origin, original. Original. Um, what's it called? Panorama date? No. And that looks like a Cartier box. I think Graham needs to send more of these in the future. And he was just highlighting the, the bracelet. I don't know if you know your bracelet references and end link references, if you'd like to see, but uh, really nice seeing this watch in pretty good condition. And there's a few more from Graham that we will be seeing at a later stage. Uh, this seems to, the, the alphabetical order seems to jump around often. But uh, thank you for these, Graham. We're going to be looking at a few more from you just now. This is from James, and it's an Eterna Contiki. And he has two of these pieces. 
very seldomly do we see numerals inside the quarters and reminds me directly of the Zodiac Seawolf. I don't know if this is a reissue of an original from back in the day. Um, lovely Tudor, exactly, blue shirt. Um, love the Santos. The Santos Dumont is amazing as well, Amar. Uh, Amur, I'm botching your name every single time. Um, so a great looking piece. This, uh, I don't know how the loom works on this watch, why, why the color is like a teal almost. We've got lovely sword hands. We've got a date window set inside here with a small little hand. That's, that's interesting. You very seldomly see a loomed handset on your date on the dial. And then in contrast, he also has it in silver. So James loves this piece. I, I don't know why he has both of them. I think it's probably a, a set that he wanted to collect over time. I've never heard of this before, ever. Never heard of an Eterna Kontiki. Eterna as a brand, I think one of their claim to fames was the, uh, the Dirty Dozen in 1940, whenever. They were one of the 12 who helped contribute to the, the struggle. <laughs> Eterna is dying, truth is. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I don't know anything about the brand at all. And Kontiki, I mean, look at the, the texture. Was this to try and, and mimic some, some form of, oh, I see, they're actually arrows. Look at that. It's an arrow running at a diagonal. It reminds me of, of metal, you would see, you know, kind of corrugated metal. Looks great, though. Really nice. And next to this, James also, and James from last week sent in uh, a white dial, Globemaster. He has just received a, his blue dial, Globemaster. And it's a watch that I, I gave a bit of airtime to last week because the Globemaster is one of the best contemporary Amigas I've ever seen. I think it is a gem, a real gem. Taking elements from all of the original constellations from 1950, 60, 70, putting it all together into this one watch that looks fairly timeless at this point, competing directly with the likes of the Datejust. Um, but lots of other little things. I do address the Datejust competition in uh, the write-up for the constellation. So we'll be hearing about that as well. But the blue dial in this light looks almost black, right? Looks nice, really nice looking piece. And the pie pan is so subtle. You wouldn't even know that this has a pie pan dial. If you look on the inside, you see those small outlines there, star highlighting constellation, globe master. I mean, there you get a good under a good idea behind the text, just how well it was used. I think, yeah, Amiga did some great, great things with this piece. Very, uh, very underrated as a watch, as Bud Owen says. And I think he also sent me Speedmaster Date. This is an automatic reference. I don't know if this was a coaxial yet, but we seldomly see a Speedmaster in this configuration. So this was also from James. And we'll get back to the chat, address some of you here. Um, Eterna is the same company that makes ETA movements. Oh, is that so, Thorsley? Thank you. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm so behind. <laughs> I'm so behind with my watch knowledge. As much as I try to get on top of things. Uh, Velju 7750 from James. Thank you. So is this, is this your, uh, your Amiga? Okay, got it, got it. So just before we transitioned over to the, co the coaxials that we would know and love, I'm taking another hit of coffee and I'll get back in. Okay. It's great that you guys are addressing yourselves and uh, just enjoying the chat as we go. He said he did mention he likes the idea that this, this dial has faded ever so slightly. Looks great. It looks like a midsize as well. You can correct me on that. Um, Japan edition, apparently. Thank you, James. Thank you for that. Okay, so thank you for sending these in. Terrific. Next from Jeffrey. Now, the next three watches that we're going to see are beautiful. Absolutely gorgeous. First up, reference 5277, Breguet Classique. One of the best contemporary Breguets out there at the moment. Um... I am really a fan of this reference. They've, they've, done a, they've had a few models uh, similar to this in the past. They've got one that has that 10 hertz movement, but this one is just Breguet in the purest form. And what amazing shots. Thank you so much for sending these in, Jeffrey. All of the little details. Uh, you, go into the, you go into the dial and you see the, the double Breguet inscribed on the oh, It's just insane. The guilloche. I mean, look at the texture. It's amazing right? to think that this is machine turned and you can really enjoy. I mean, this is enough to give you serious brain damage. <laughs> uh, we have a, a 96 hour power reserve. 
I could grate some fine cheese, Buganish. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, 96 hour power reserve. I would imagine it probably goes up to about 100 hours. They generally, brands understate the, the level of their power reserves. Um, and then you just see that the gold highlights, the blued hands. You know, Breguet is a brand for me one day, I think. It's, it's a real enthusiast brand. You get it when you, when you know about watches and you don't necessarily want anyone else to know what you're wearing. It's a real character. Uh, again, I'll say the write-up that I'm doing on a certain armed force, Breguet is featured quite a lot in it. So uh, <laughs> I'll still say Breguet should have the engraving on each side of the 12 and not the printing Breguet, but Owens. And, and was this done fairly recently? Was this a modern thing that they did? Uh, or is this quite a vintage uh, idea of having it on either side of the 12? I love it. I really, that one thing that Breguet does so nicely is between their pieces, they like to hide little details. Like they might have a, a B at the, at the eight or at the four or whatever else. They do have these little quirky details. And it makes it so interesting. What I like about Breguet as a brand and as a family is that they've never really moved away from their uh, pocket watch heritage. They've kept it and really capitalized off it. You, you only know that this is a Breguet because, I mean, you just look at it and say, well, what is it? It's a glorified pocket watch converted into a wristwatch. And there's another Breguet that we'll be seeing in a second. But in rose gold as well, it's stunning. It's a real piece of art for sure. So thank you for this, Jeffrey. Next, I, I can't remember the, the order that he told me about these pieces, where he wears them and when. But uh, next is a Jean, and it's a Souverain or Souverain or souverain, however you want to say it. The asymmetry on this piece is a thing of beauty. Very similar to Breguet, Jean has come out of the gates with his own approach to watchmaking, modern but classic. And uh, we, we talked about the, the chronometer blue a couple of weeks, a couple of months back, I don't know. And the asymmetry, that, that beauty of having both asymmetrical subdial and a power reserve it's just so neat and tidy. I, this, this has to be one of the best dials that John makes. Uh, and Inivet et Fesit, I probably completely butchered that. It means that he made it, made by him, something like that. I can never remember. <laughs> and Lange, Lange is superior to Breguet. Joe, I, yeah, I believe since Lange is, they, they are definitely pioneering. I mean, Breguet was the pioneer. I mean, we know that. If it wasn't for Breguet, probably would not see half the things that we do today. Lunga at this point is picking up the pioneering efforts, making triple splits, et cetera, et cetera. You know, Lumen, Zeitwerk, Lumen, uh, Datagraph Lumens, all these little bits and pieces. As, a, as far as watchmaking goes, I think Lunga does have a, a, an edge above Brega. But in saying that, I mean, they are their own brands. It's like comparing Lunga and Patek. Uh, can you really do that? Um, Gorgeous piece. I also love the monochromatic effect that this has. It's just black and white, black and cream. Um, but mention about but overpriced. Yeah, absolutely. This this is one of the the desired watches in the family, and yeah, I just like that it looks fairly simple for what it is. You know, but a character. And last, he invented it and made it. Thank you, John. Last but not least, from Jeffrey Vacheron Constantin, historique, triple calendar, and the reference. Let me try and get it right. A cal calendria, 1942. So I would imagine that this is a reissue of a 1942 variant. And I mean, it's a VC. You can tell by the, the lug integration. Um, again, love how they play with the idea of having a date wheel that runs around the dial instead of having a window. Um, it's, it's a gorgeous looking watch. And the cream effect, the cream on white, the blued hands. Also, just looking at the small details, like how the two has been addressed. You don't see that anymore. Um, let's have another look at the two at the 12. The nines, open nines. I mean, why can't more brands be adventurous with the typefaces on their models? The eight has that nice flair there at the base. A serif on the seven. Very interesting. You don't see serifs on any of the other numerals. You don't see a serif on the three or the four, but you have a nice hook on the seven. Small details, you know, uh, blue highlights, cream finish. I'm just pulling it out so you can see a bit more detail. Definitely looks to be a watch from 19, what does mention about 1941, 1942. Nice range of watches, Zane, I agree. Uh, these are the three that he has, I think, and he wears them on different occasions. I think he said that the Jean is his daily wearer. He pretty much rocks this every day. The Breguet for special occasions and the VC for um, 
you know, appointments. I don't know. It's all down to understatement. How how much do you want to really wear under the radar, you know? So thank you so much, Jeffrey, for all of these. Uh, VC is my least favorite out of the three. Yeah, it definitely is polarizing. I mean, you can see that it is, you could say, dated at this point in time. Very much like a lot of other watches that we've seen, my, my 57 Seamaster dated. It looks like a watch from its time period. And it's very difficult to get yourself out of that time period, just down to the use of typeface, the use of hands, for example, these very sharp pencil hands. You don't see that anymore. Okay, as we go through, this is from Jimmy next. And he is a freighter pilot. He's a captain flying a B777. And this is what he wears. And for the life of me, I am, this is actually, I didn't realize it's a Coke. <laughs> I thought it was a Pepsi. And it's a 16710, I hope. I don't know if I got the reference right or not, but it uh, looks like it's a no holes case, solid end link. Just great seeing this watch worn by a pilot who flies, and you get to see all the details in the cockpit. And uh, that's just nice. Nice seeing a bit of context behind the watch. You know, great presence. Uh, and there's also a really nice shot that he shared. This is cool. I like this. So you get to see the jets. I've never seen this before in a cockpit. I mean, this is great. We actually get to see some behind the scene. So you're actually able to see the individual jets. And when you dump fuel, et cetera, you get to see all of those details on the screen. I mean, planes, there's a reason why they cost billions, you know? And let's get into the watch. Let me just get another close up of the piece for everyone to have a look at. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, 16710, I'm guessing, but I might be completely wrong. Uh, uh, let's see, have a have a love, have to love Coke from time to time, found it, absolutely. We don't see Coke bezels often and much more subdued than the Pepsi. You could get away with this watch as a much more understated piece, I believe, on a daily basis. And uh, you can see if one is on fire, <laughs> Mr. Perpetual. Uh, thank you, Jimmy. I'm actually right for once. I I'm GMT references I'm also terrible with. Uh, but this is great. It's so nice that uh, we're all managing to keep up in the chat and I can address you and there's good enough space. The Darth Maul, is that what they call it, Maz? <laughs> um, and Jan James saying Pan Am commissioned them. Are we talking about the, the plane? We're not talking about the plane. We're talking about the watch. Uh, the Coke bezel from Pan Am. Don't know if that's the case. Someone correct him, please, or let, it, let me know the details. So, Next from John. Thank you for this, Jimmy. Great to see it in context. I love the screen is what really hooked me in this picture. It's so nice seeing that bit of background. Uh, being a pilot is no joke, ladies and gentlemen. Next from John. This is a PAM 560 on a Horace strap. So it's an eight-day power reserve, Luminor. And the cleanliness on this dial, it is something else. I think it looks great. It really does. It, it captures that radio mirror styling you know you've got a radio mirror-esque dial but you've got the the luminor uh crown guard protector and that cushion case everything is very uh typical of panerai and i think that's what makes it such an interesting brand is when a, when a brand can actually hold on to what made their pieces special back in the day so it looks cool thanks mr perpetual yeah eight day power reserve and it looks nice on the strap as well. Very toned down camo instead of, it's more like an urban camo. It's not your, your typical camo that you would see, you know, your fatigues. This looks more like something that you would wear uh, in an urban setting for your special forces in the streets, et cetera, et cetera. Looks nice, really is nice. Um, and a sandwich dial as well. We must remember that these dials are very unique. And uh, yeah, great piece. So thank you for sending this in, John. And I don't know if this was the same John or not, but there was a, there's a highlight of a Seiko cocktail time. And I always call this piece a presage. I don't know what, I don't know if it is a presage or not. Might need to clarify there. I am terrible with Seiko references. <laughs> um, and Final Time is Capital says, it's time to bring pans back out of collections and dust them off. They're awesome watches. You know, if it was me putting in my thoughts on these pieces, all that I think they would really need to do would be to scale them down ever so slightly. We know that the big watch trend of the 90s, it's come and gone for the most part. Many people still enjoy the, the size and the styling, but I think if that to bring down the size ever so slightly and uh, I don't know, approach it, still keep the traditional elements like the cushion case, the, the dial that everyone knows and loves, but bring in something a little bit more modern in a few places, uh, 
this watch on a mesh strap, for example, would look so good. You know, just innovate in an area. It's, it's sad to see that Panerai is losing its momentum because people just aren't interested enough in the brand. But it has an amazing history. I mean, it is, it is the original dive watch. And you think about the history. I mean, Rolex made movements for them. And uh, yeah. Anyway, I'm going to carry on. So Seiko cocktail time. Really like this photograph. We get to see the, the texture on the dial. Please let me know if this is a presage. If that's the, the name for it. The new green pams are great and something. Yeah, the, the, any, any watch that has a camo finish, a hand grenade, uh, you know, olive drab effect looks superb. And uh, going to carry on with this. So thank you for sending in this piece, John. I think this is the same John who sent in the cocktail time. I don't know. Great use of texture. Seiko and their dials. Next from John. This is John without an H. First Omega in space. Oops. And we get to see the first Omega in space in its reissue form. And I would imagine this is the original leather strap that came with it as well. And I think he sent me another shot of it on the wrist. Oh, that is terrific. Okay, let's have a good look at this first. Um, so it has a sapphire crystal, if I'm not wrong. And that was something that was pointed out to me. So the real um, the real debate, the point of contention with this Ed White reissue that came out beginning of this year is that it uses all of these elements, essentially, just with a 3 two, one movement. And when we talk about value for money, bang per buck, this one is a steal. It's a great watch because you're getting an original styled piece that has a modern caliber. Uh, the only thing that it doesn't have is a Hesalite crystal, has a sapphire crystal, which might uh, deter a few people. I don't think it has a clear case back either, which is a bit of a shame. And it would be nice to see if, the, if they gave it the 57 bracelet treatment, you know, the 57 reissues of that, the gorgeous, uh, you know, floating uh, center link and the original style clasps and everything. I think that would also draw more people in. So let's get into the actual close-up of the watch on the wrist. And there's a mention about legibility. Let's see. Um, total bang for dollar. And Philly's dad, welcome to the show. Didn't realize. Yeah, I um, I kept it under the radar. I didn't want to highlight it too much and, and advertise it because by Monday this week, I already had 100 submissions. <laughs> so I thought, you know, what, what better thing to do than share all of these pieces with you? So I, I hope you're all enjoying it. And uh, let's see, first to me in space, that's not the original strap though. Yeah, Nick, I agree. And there's one thing that I'm actually surprised. I mean, they charge a lot of money for this watch. Why wouldn't they include a strap with it as well? A, a pr proper bracelet with the strap. Um, and there was a mention about legibility from Eric. Legibility is super poor with the polished hands. I couldn't keep it in the collection. Very interesting point. And since you, you notice, one, one thing that I don't really like about this reference is that you have the white hand for the chronograph. So you notice the chronograph hand is white. The subdial for the 30 minutes and for the 12 hour is also white, but the sub seconds, the running seconds is also polished. So when you're looking at it from a certain angle, I don't know if this captures it, you, you would lose the polish of the hands very easily. And yeah, it is, it's divisive because you want to see the hands. I mean, that's what made the professionals so great is that you got to see everything at a glance without, uh, without looking too hard. But small little details like the applied logo is nice. Also, fascinating that they decided to use a blue loom on this piece and not your traditional green that you would expect to see. Uh, this is your modern loom take. So I don't know. There, there are a few elements that I find surprising, quite peculiar about this model. I would have loved to have seen this on an original bracelet. Uh, John, if I were you, I'd be getting on eBay and finding an original bracelet from the 60s and 70s. They're still very attainable and they will just look so good. The watch would look 10 times better, I believe. The original bracelets from Amiga in those days were just terrific watch um, elements. And Alpha Hands, yeah, Alpha Hands, that's what made the watch so so interesting back then. But yeah, it got replaced for the pencil hands and time changes. Lumen Screen is just the lighting. Thank you, Eric. Is that so? How did that work? It looks very blue to me. <laughs> Maybe I'm losing my eyesight. And John also sent in a Smith's Air Ministry. So this is the reissue of, I'd like to know if you guys know this one as, as far as history goes. I'm just getting to you in the chat and in the comments. Uh, how's it going? Yes, I'd like a bracelet with an extra strap on the side. This is perpetual, I agree. I mean, that's what makes the Omega reissue so good. Another, another detail with that, the CK29 
CK2998 they brought out with the blue bezel and everything else, also only on a leather strap. And I think to myself, why not also include a bracelet? I mean, it's what made the watch such a character of the day, you know? Um, okay, so this piece, Smith's Air Ministry, for anyone who can guess what time period this comes from, this was during the Second World War. These were watches issued to RAF. No, I'm saying that's wrong. This is a 50s era. No, it's not. It's not. So, damn it, I almost missed it there. Omega and Longines did a lot of transplanting back in the day. They shared a lot of their dials. They shared their manufacturers and everything else. And this is basically Smith's is attempt. This is a modern piece. Their attempt of recreating, and it was something like the CK2918. CK2, CK2818 or CK2918 reference that Longines and Omega both had. They were essentially uh, wristwatches for RAF pilots in the 1940s, all the way through the Second World War. And then we transitioned to, to other pieces. But uh, this is obviously a modern take from Time Factors, Smiths. I really enjoy the brand, as you know. I love the little Smiths Everest. And they're doing some great stuff, I think, as far as... as uh, reintroducing these traditional pieces, it's an enthusiast's watch. And only you would know that this is a piece that is, uh, you know, paying homage to one that was introduced in the 40s. And uh, yeah, great piece. Uh, that's not that old. I think we're talking about 40s. Uh, I love the old Smith's logo with the crown. Yeah, I mean, that's that's it. I mean, they, they really nailed it. They got every detail, even the original England. Uh, but I, I have to, this has to be a reissue. This is definitely not original. <laughs> See, I'm that bad. There was mention about 1999. Considering the Smith's Expedition, great looking watch as well. I mean, that is that is the piece that uh, went up Everest using you know during the fifties, and it did a great job there as well. It uses the same aesthetics from that timeline. And Hans, I love you too. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, I love doing this. The show is always great, and we're doing pretty well. We are hitting the two hour mark very soon. And we've still got a fair share of watches on show. So let's carry on. John, thank you so much for those pieces. Uh, this is from Joshua. A date just reference 16233. Interesting use of a filter here. Uh, I can imagine it's a two-tone with a champagne dial by the looks of things. Great seeing it on the wrist. You get a good understanding of the presence. High top crystal. And I mean, the date just, it's just a character. I'm still working on a write-up for this family. And I hope to do it very soon in the future. Um, I'll get the Everest for my birthday. Yeah, it's a nice looking, it's a really nice watch. I mean, the, the sad thing is I haven't been wearing it. Some people were saying that uh, the, the Everest is going to lose its wrist time. I haven't taken this Omega off in a month and a half. So I do need to force myself to wear my other watches <laughs> over the coming weeks. Um, anyway, great looking piece. Thank you for this, Joshua. I think you were in the chat a second ago. Uh, Dead just it's a 16233. Is that it? I got it right. Great. Uh, I hope I got it right. Read it out. Nice looking piece. I mean, what can you say about a two-tone, two-tone date just from that time? And moving on, this is also from Joshua, and it's an Oris Aquas Hulk. I don't know what they call this reference. I need to force myself to do a discussion on Oris as a brand. And this just discuss the, the design elements about it. The one thing, I said this in the last stream, actually, we, we featured it on the show. Uh, the one element about Oris that I just don't get with these Aquas pieces uh, is that it's just so simple. There's nothing that screams at me. Nothing jumps out and says, this is what I am. Uh, the one element that I do know about Oris is that the handset is quite unique to the family, but the batons are all the same. Um, even, the, even the numerals on the bezel are the same. And I think Bruce Williams did a video on this piece, and he, he received a, a, a replica of this watch. Who would make a replica of this piece? I, I do not <laughs> I do not know the story, uh, but I do need to discuss this. And the 65, is that what it's called? The RS65 family, I think, are fantastic. We need more dive watches that are low-key, thin, under the radar, simple, you know? Okay, going to carry on from Juan. Now, Juan sent in so many watches to all of us. Thank you, Joshua, for this, by the way. I don't know where to start with, with Juan's collection. I had to really cull a lot of pieces that he sent through because there were just so many. And he collects both modern Rolex and everything in between, but also vintage 50s and 60s era. Amazing. Okay, let's have a look at the comments. I've missed a lot of them. Uh, Dylan saying, it's hard to take off one you're still wearing over the moon. Love. Yeah, I haven't taken my SKX off for a while and my IWC is getting jealous. 
it's a weird thing, right? Oris Shrek, actually. <laughs> uh, Oris logo is quite boring as well. I think, I mean, I would love for Oris. Oris, if you're listening, contact me and let's let's really punch out a great piece. I could help you with a few things. We could make a terrific watch in your modern segment. I would love to help. Um, another thing that I don't understand is Oris is very big on bronze and I'm going to come next week, I think. I will record a divisive video on bronze watches and why I just don't understand them <laughs> as materials. Uh, there's a great email sent in. I can't remember who did, but talk about Wabi Sabi and yeah, we'll, we'll get to it. I will definitely talk about it in more detail. Beautiful Bolova Accutron. We get to see just how time has aged this watch. It still looks like it's in great condition. And there's a terrific Hamilton that we'll be seeing in a second. Um, Oris Big Crown Pointer. Yeah, that's what I mean. Found when I'm talking about the bronze watch, I really don't understand it at all. But um, let's see what else is going on. Talking about the pointer date. I need to do a video on that for sure. Um, nice that they're still independent. Absolutely, Mark. They are their own brand at this point, which means that they have so much more creative license, which is why they should bring on outsiders to come and help them design things. And I think they could do some great work. They're not being dictated to by corporate yet, you know? Um, so this is great little Accutron. And there's lots of watches from Juan. So I'm going to slowly get through them at this point. Uh, this, I mean, look at this. This is a unique piece. It's a Hamilton. Coronado from 1928, 1930. He doesn't actually know the exact timeline, but between 1928, 1930, enamel bezel, white gold, and look at that bezel. That's a cool looking watch, right? Reminds me of Elgin from the time period. So I really find it commendable when a collector not only has modern pieces, but also just, just some amazing old school watches in the set as well. Um, so Philly's dad says bronze is a good material for anything that goes into the water. It's patina actually protects the metal better than steel actually, but it looks weird. Yeah, Philly's dad. The one, the one thing I'll actually save it for the video, my, my gripes with it, but I can understand that as far as, I mean, it was such a great material back in the day when they didn't have stainless steel and alloys and all of that. Um, but if you like rust, if you like the smell, if you like the color, by all means go for it. Uh, they're very popular on social media. Hans asking me if I'm enjoying the 57. I haven't taken it off in a month and a half. I wear it every day. I pretty much wear it like a Seiko. I was chatting to founder Timeless Capital today. I say, you know, I do everything with it and it doesn't come off. It just does it all, all I need at this point in time, you know? Anyway, uh, getting back to you here. Dylan saying, others, anyone remember the high end brand recently used metal from Titanic for cases? <laughs> yeah, what was the name? Julissi Nardan, wasn't it? I'm pretty sure it was Ulysses Nardan that did it. And they do some funky stuff. Yeah, I agree. I think that was the brand. Uh, they used proper bronze from the ship. Anyway, I'm going to move on. I love this Hamilton. I'm taking another swig before getting back in. You can see where Frank Mueller got it from. Yeah, I agree. I mean, this case shape, everything. Again, reminds me of uh, those, those American-made watches of the time. I mean, they all kept the same kind of styling. Great piece. Next from Juan, another Hamilton chronograph. And this is an original chronomatic. Great looking watch, right? I mean, panda aesthetic, nice and simple. Uh, you get to see the, I hope this is most definitely an original. The way I can tell is it says Swiss made T. So there's your faded tritium on the dial. Also enjoy the crown being backwards and the pushers being the other way around. Yeah, nice looking watch. I mean, we've seen reissues of this piece before, but this is an original. And, oh, that's the name, Romain Jerome. That's exact. Founder, you're right. That's it. You, found Times Capital's knowledge is a basically a yellow pages when it comes to watches. <laughs> Romain Jerome, that's the Titanic watch. And they do, they do uh, space-related ones as well with moon dust and meteorite and all of that. Okay. Uh, and and Coates, Coates says, I swear first black date window. Is this one of the originals? I really don't know. Caliber 11. Great point, Thomas Burnett. Were they using Hoyer caliber 11s? I highly doubt it. Hoyer, uh, Hamilton's generally been very in-house. Yeah, but I love it. The Panda aesthetic, you can't go wrong with it at all. Love the detail, the contrast. Moving on, this Ventura is one of the best watches of the show for me, for my taste. Um, let's see, Dylan, thank you so much. You sent in some watches. And uh, so Joshua is a coffee roaster. I'll send you an email. You can send us some. 
Absolutely. I'd love to promote it, Joshua. If you do, I will feature it on the show. I'll take some photos. I'll let everyone know what it tastes like and everything. I am by no means a coffee nut. So uh, I just enjoy it. You know, it gets gets me buzzed. <laughs> you know, most of the time nowadays, I just drink. I just drink and eat what is best for me at the time. If I need energy, I'll eat fat. If I need something to really get me going quick, I'll hit the caffeine. <laughs> I'm a simple guy. <laughs> this watch, I think, is just absolutely stellar. So it's a Ventura Electric, and the case styling is just terrific. I think it's so unique. And what made this watch fantastic, he, Juan also attached a, the Elvis watch, fantastic. He also attached a detail highlighting just how this movement worked. And you can correct me if I'm wrong, but they, this watch uses a battery as your mainspring, essentially. So the watch is still mechanical. It still has a balance bridge. It still has uh, your, your rubies on your forks, your padded forks, but the battery is what actually powers the watch. So it is still essentially a mechanical, but it has a battery to power it as well. And I really like the aesthetic. I think that shape is just definitely not every, up everyone's alley. I think it's a 14 karat gold reference as well. Kind of feminine. Yeah. I mean, I would imagine because it is, I don't know if you're talking about this piece, but it is uh, definitely of the deco time period, you know, that timeline. Um, patent pending. Interesting. So this was just when the electric movement was introduced. You'd have to let me know more about this. I, I definitely didn't brush up on my knowledge of this watch before the show began. Anyway, thank you for this, Juan. There's a few more pieces that you sent in. I think he's just, yeah, he has the original boxes for all of these watches. Great looking piece. Very, uh, very Aztec in the way it's presented, you know, space age. And this is, this is a 50s era watch, no? I would imagine that this is a 50s styled piece. Uh, and this, this is actually a different piece. Oh, geez. I've actually, because he sent in so many watches, I have mistaken. So look at the lugs on this watch compared to this one. Two Venturas, two different time periods, I would imagine. And uh, yeah, he's just sent in such great stuff. I've had to cull, like I said, cull a lot of watches that he's submitted because uh, he's just shown us so many. So he's got an olive black bay. I love the olive strap on it. I think it's a rubber bee. Um, so Maz says, maybe a show with non-round watches should be interesting. It would be amazing because, I mean, who's to say that watches need to be round? I think that's one element that deserves a video in itself. Uh, why is it that watches are round? It's just because they always have been, so therefore it's aesthetically great. don't know. Um, moving on, there's, there's still a few more from Juan. Oh, wow, look at the shot. Panda de Tona. Don't crucify me. I don't know what this... What this uh, flower arrangement is looks like a bougainvillea might be wrong there but wow we get some good lighting Quan, thank you so much for sending these in i um i struggle with saving excess images but when the photography is this great i have to keep it you know um i like the internal the eternal super contiki remake i don't know anything about it ron i need to look up the, the brand and that history but all of these companies bringing out their reissues it's commendable um yeah, so this panda looks terrific. In the light, the color contrast, we get some gorgeous pinks. Hold on a sec, Magic Mouse. Gorgeous pinks in the background. Ah, it's, it's a great looking piece. Moving on, another shot. I called this Pepsi GMT, whoops. <laughs> um, olive Drab. This is how you could enjoy a Black Bay 58. I think that strap integration just looks so neat and clean. And oh, GB, it's a pleasure. It is an absolute pleasure, Graham. Um, I think there's a few more of them, actually. As we go through, my uh, the alphabetical order seems to jump around often, so we will see some more in a second. Um, no symmetry with reading hands when dial isn't round, but still love the Ventura series. Interesting, though, and that's true. I mean, when it comes to reading the, the time quickly, it's probably very difficult when you have asymmetrical dials and everything else. But then again, look at the Cartier tank and the Santos. Those models are still great, and you could tell the time well. But asymmetry, difficult thing to wrap your head around. And another piece from Juan, his Pepsi GMT, Mark I, Mark II. This looks to be more red and blue than, uh, than fuchsia and just purple. Uh, this, this is a great watch. It really is nice. The Batgirl is one that speaks to me more than this piece. Uh, I find the Pepsi is a little bit too vibrant for my tastes as an everyday wearer. But, yeah, nice piece. I mean, it's... It's amazing just how the hype value, the hype factor has just flown skyrocketed <laughs> with these watches as, you know, 
It's also sad that Rolex isn't releasing any new pieces this year and that they've pulled out of Basel World and, you know, American Jedi, you were first. Your, your watches were featured at the very, very beginning. Thank you for joining us. Um, so, so Juan, this is just gorgeous. This, I love this, this combination, the olive finish. I think, uh, what was, who was it? Ron said, this guy has good taste. Yeah, ne this is the best strap I've seen on a 58. It looks so good. And we get right into the detail. Let's just look at the texture of the strap. Rubber B, I hope I'm, I'm guessing it's right, rubber B. You know what would make this watch infinitely cooler? If this dial had the same texture as the strap. Imagine that, you know, that ruffled up almost uh, gravel effect that you get on, on some of the vintage shooters that you see nowadays. Yeah, the Black Bay 58, I mean, it's, it's a terrific entry-level luxury. I think that's what I, I highlighted it as a couple of months back. Uh, Tom Austin, thank you. Welcome. Thank you for joining. Um, but there are also a little point, there are points that many say that it would be nice to see this watch with a snowflake dial as well as the snowflake hands. I agree. I would love to see that combination. At least, just imagine the Black Bay 58, blue on blue, with snowflake dial. Done. Snowflake dial, snowflake hands, blue dial, blue bezel. Oh, it looks so clean. It's, I mean, the creative potential and opportunity that Tudor has in this segment, it's infinite. It's just, uh, it's just knowing what uh, Rolex wants, you know, what the crown says, the shield follows. Uh, one of the best statements I've probably ever made about the families. Uh, this is a Hodinkee swatch. I don't know anything about this piece. Uh, if you might, this is a System 51, I would imagine. Uh, but you can tell me in the comments what this reference is about and what exactly it is. Um, I really don't know. But, you know, Hodinkee is doing pretty well with their reissues and their, their approach to things. Um, it's amazing just how a brand can push a piece out there. And let's see what else is going on. There's just that's so many yikes, as Joe says. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and real real men, Struthia says, real men wear a swatch. Hmm. Hodinkee's done some better swatches than these. I think they're, they're some great looking watches. Uh, in that segment, the System 51 is quite fascinating, be an, being an all machine built mechanical movement. Yeah, what, what the crown the crown leads, shield follows. Yeah, I mean, that's that's been my one line that I mentioned a long time ago. Uh, it's one of the first videos I ever did. I don't know, when I was a bit more original back in the day, you know, with, with the write-ups. And the crown jewel from Juan, Vacheron Constantin, overseas on a blue rubber strap supplied with this watch. I mean, I'll leave this up for a little while because we can really enjoy this. Um, have I shown a Ploprof? No, I haven't. A cruising Gypsy, not yet. Uh, there's no Ploprof on the show, sadly, but I don't think, I have I have featured a modern Ploprof before and a baby Ploprof from Thomas Burnett. So yeah, a lot. So talking about this watch and uh, really enjoyed that Corey Richards uh, one of one Vacheron Everest that came out on Thursday, that video that I did. Um, this is a real, I, I really hope this becomes a cult classic one day and people get drawn to this because as far as value for money, for what you're getting, uh, it is a beautiful, the design is great. I really truly think the design is great. Some might say it's cliche that the bezel matches the Maltese cross. I say this every time, but just considering that it has this, this symmetry to its dial, and that it lines up shoulder to shoulder with the Nautilus and the Royal Oak. It's an enthusiast's watch at this point and uh, very commendable. So Juan, thank you for sending this all in. Uh, gonna, keep, gonna keep rolling on as we do. From Justin, Seamaster Professional 300, black on black. Nice seeing this watch. I think this, there's, there's one or two of these as we go through. Sure, we're doing pretty well. Two hours and 15 minutes we've been running the show and we've, we've nailed it. I think pace is, is what matters on these shows. Got to keep the pace up. <laughs> uh, and Ron, the overseas you featured in the video was absolutely incredible. It's gorgeous, right? Um, I was following it before uh, social media picked it up. If you, if not social media, before um, Hodinkee and, and all the publishers started promoting the watch, I was following Vacheron <clears throat> and I was following Corey Richards well over a year ago, knowing that he had this partnership with them. And seeing that watch unveiled, I was just blown away, gobsmacked. I think I might have featured it on the show once or twice, but never did a, a video on it directly. So it was great. Uh, from Sun City, California, Gilbert, welcome. And uh, such nice watches, right? Uh, really is. Why do watch snobs hate? We're talking about Boulevard Longines. You know, 
to each their own. That's what I say. I mean, that's what makes this this whole uh, segment great. What I what I enjoy about the series Wrist Shot Week is that we get to enjoy what everyone wears instead of being marketed to about what is popular, what is important in the collectible scheme and, and all of that. Anyway, I'm going to carry on. So thank you for this, Justin. Carassus next. Carassus should be in the chat, but he sent this through pretty early on uh, today. 5711R. One element that I love about the Nautilus and just Patek in general is when they deal with rose gold and the brown dial, it's quite something. And I think there's another Nautilus that we're going to be seeing just now in a second. But uh, it's, it's amazing how simple this watch actually is when you see it in this presentation. Now, visually, it looks relatively simple. And rose gold as a, as a color, you get to really enjoy it on many different skin tones. It doesn't stand out too much. It's not too in your face. Uh, very stylish for what it is. But of course, the Nautilus and the hype factor is just through the roof and, you know, people go out of their way. Another watch that I think is, is even more interesting, as Russell says, brown and rose, great match. Similar to the Aquanaut, I've really fallen for the Aquanaut with the rose, full rose gold and just the simple, simple layout. No, no time, uh, you know, world time, comp not, uh, local and GMT time complication. I just like the simplicity of it all. Okay, so this is great. Thank you for this, Carassus. But the next watch, he enjoys more. It's a Royal Oak 25721ST. And what he said in his email to me, if I remember right, is that it's, it's amazing that this piece is as old as it is at this point. It is something like 10, 15, correct me if I'm wrong about the age, but this is the original overseas, no? And this has a tritium dial, and he's noticed that the dial has begun to fade. And even now, after all this time, the watch still looks like uh, overseas it hasn't aged you know visually over that time period and it's a nice looking watch very subdued uh, you can see just how it began very simple it wasn't this overblown yeah it's pretty big but it wasn't this overblown dial with with huge numerals and just flashy colors everywhere it was nice and understated uh shy town saying rose gold day day 40 with chocolate dial all day for me i mean it's a great watch right um the 40, the 40 is, is quite a commendable. If you can pull it off, it's a great watch to wear. Um, nice offshore. Yeah, Zane, it is. It's terrific. It really is cool. Nice seeing an original. I mean, this is the first over, over, offshore, overshore. <laughs> this is the original, if I'm not wrong. So please correct me. Uh, but it's nice seeing how it all began. And I mean, just look at, I love this. Look at the detail on the dial. A little bit of a serif going on here. I don't know if they've still used this typeface with their modern pieces. I find the latest offshores are quite brash, a little bit too heavy, where this is still subdued enough, enjoyable. Okay, carrying on. Carassus, thank you for these. I hope you're still in the chat. This is from Carl, and he sends in his Grand Seiko SBGC229 GTR, and he's got a hungry monster in the background there. So this was released in tandem with the GTR. With I think we featured this a couple of times on the show before. Um, it's it's a very peculiar piece. I mean, it's let me try and film this sideways. There we go. The world is now fully flipped. Uh, it's it's interesting how they've taken the the, the Nissan style dial layout and then integrated it in. Uh, it's all ceramic. It is a full ceramic case. Yeah, I remember that. That's one detail that makes it cool. And just the the texture on the dial. They do a lot of great things with this watch. I find the combination of elements quite peculiar, though. Have to admit. I mean, it's it's a sports watch, but also trying to be dressy and formal. I think they could have taken a little bit of a different approach with the handset on the, the hour and minutes because it's so high polish. You would expect blued hands possibly, so you could read the time easier, maybe. Maybe not, I don't know. It's, it's all up to your personal preference. But white on white is nice. Very seldomly see it. Daytona bezel, as mentioned. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Um, also love the composition. I'm a huge dog lover. Dogs are man's best friend, best animals out there. Okay, we're going to carry on moving through the real Godzilla. I think they called this the... No, they didn't. There was another special edition they called the Godzilla. Moving through. So thank you for this, Carl. And moving to David. Seiko Turtle Okinawa C. C Gradient? C, C, what are they? C Grapes. Where do they come up with these names? Okay, so I would imagine that the C Grapes lines up with the color of the dial and that 
sea grapes. It's probably a, a type of kelp that produces a grape, some kind of uh, mineral that is eaten. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just imagining here. Uh, Philly's dad will send more Philly wrist shots next time. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, I'm guessing this this was, was this your shot, Carl? Let me know. Um, I'm yeah, I'm very bad with names, and but anyway, interesting piece. How we have the yellow on the blue, the turquoise, the the matte. This is a PVD coated case, I would imagine. Don't know, but it is a turtle, and you can tell that by the case styling. There is an original Willard on the show that I think we will be seeing just now. Sea cucumber hoplite. I think that's that's a pretty good analogy. And Carlos, sorry that you couldn't see your original your original pieces that arrived earlier on. Uh, don't worry, it'll always be here if you'd like to catch up with the show in the future. But I should do watches with Dog Show founder. I would love to. I lost both my girls two years ago, so uh, it would be a sad day for me because I'll be seeing amazing dogs and not have any to share with you. But anyway, um, long jean sector. Okay, so thank you, David, for that. And now we jump to Freddie Turner. And I can't remember where he said, I think this was in the Netherlands. I can't remember where he mentioned this was taken. But uh, by the way, does anyone in the chat know what a Bernese mountain dog is? I'd like to know because they are my end all be all favorite dogs in the world. Um, and yeah, I've always been. I've always loved golden retrievers. They've been my number one. But Bernese mountain dogs, they they are uh, cut above the rest. So, going to jump through to Freddie's piece, and this is the Longines Heritage Sector dial. Uh, need to get a dog. Yeah, I do. I need to get a house first, James. That's the plan. Get a house. Get a payment down, and then get a dog. Get a few. I never have one. I always have at least two dogs. Um, love to get a Bernice and a Golden together. Long jeans sector heritage piece. Now many love love this uh, love this watch for obvious reasons. I mean, the write up that I did on this really put a lot of energy into this watch and just highlighting all the little details that this piece has is a lot. Highly recommend you look it up if you haven't. I call it something like a sector dial. What did I say? The Long Jean Heritage Sector or Long Jean Heritage Classic. Um, to gem really is one of the best it's one of the best sector dials out there for sure and in fact we're going to be seeing a old school uh jlc sector in a second so i'm going to keep going and now we're talking about dogs bernie's big dogs get a terrier big pooch oh geez now it's, it's turned into the dog show <laughs> uh anyway uh, me meeting you a pick of my fiance's dog a, ch a, a cat who I've never heard of that name before, Dylan. Thank you. That'd be great. Newfoundlands. Yeah, I love Newfoundlands as well. I'm, I love, I think big dogs are, are just, they're, they're just amazing animals, different temperament altogether. Um, anyway, I've been around a lot of dogs in my life, so it's, it's great. I love talking. We should have a, a dog stream, you know, just chatting about that. Anyway, great looking piece. We, we've, we've now gone away from watches and we're talking about Dashunt and, and every other animal under the sun. Another great dog that you look up is a um, oh, what's the name? It's it's a it's a hectic name. I'm gonna try and remember it now. It's all French. Uh, uh, Basset Griffon Vendine, petit or a grand, a petit or a grand Basset Griffon Vendine. They are so so cute. But then you're dealing with a hound, and you know every dog in every family has its pros and cons. You got some that are very big when it comes to digging and barking and you know i'm more of a working dog person or a gun dog you know that that kind of kind of line chihuahua yeah there's there's so many we're talking about dogs now we're gonna go get lost so vacheron generation two i think we featured this piece on the show or this is gen one we featured this on the show before and again this is also from freddie he's pulled the crown out <sighs> screw in your crown freddie are you mad you want pollen to get in there or something daft or a bug to fly in there? You're going to destroy your watch, man. <laughs> no, it's great. Uh, it's it's really quite the character of its time. It definitely, you can see the elements, how it transitioned to the Gen 3 that we know, but keeps various elements like the 222 style bracelet and uh, living on the edge. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, Zane. I mean, he is living on the edge with this madman, absolute madman. Thank you for these, Freddie. Uh, it's always a gem seeing these. I mean, we, we seldom ever see these generation, these earlier generation variants of the family. Moving through to Graham again, Thomas Burnett. Thank you. 
sending me a dog. This is fantastic. Uh, if your Seamaster was a dog, which dog would it be? Tao asks. Would we pair dogs with watches? That would be a lot of fun. I feel there'll be a lot of work for me, though. <laughs> That's great. I'm going to think about it. I haven't, I haven't, you know, maybe a Rottweiler <laughs> because of the teeth, you know, or a Doberman. Actually, Doberman Pinscher for sure. I mean, okay, I'm going to get back to it. Let's get back up and just have a good look. I reckon Doberman Pinscher. That's pretty good. Black on black. You've got some tan in there. That would be a lot of fun as a subject, don't you think? <laughs> These are important questions. Uh, it's great. Okay, getting back down. We've done pretty well. The show is running quite smoothly with everything that's been sent in. So, Freddie, thank you so much for this. And next is Graham again. Now, Graham, we, we spoke about your 5508. He sent in these wrist shots just before the show began, so I had to feature them. Look at that loom. What a terrific-looking watch. 37 and a half mils. Why can't Rolex attempt to try and rekindle those vintage-style pieces, you know? Oh, it looks great. Really does look great. Uh, rivet bracelet, the whole deal. But then next to it, check how nice this is. We've got a 1675. And again, you need to correct us in the chat if you're still here. Uh, this you traded with Theo and Harris. You traded your Cartier with it, for it. I don't know the story behind that at all, but uh, it'd be nice to know if, you, if you're still here. 1675 is just a gem. One of the first, would you believe, one of the first vintage GMTs I ever tried was an original 1675 from early 70s on a Jubilee, and it was just, it's its an amazing watch to wear. It, it wears so differently to the 90s references and the more modern ones that we know with the super cases. Uh, it feels like a real, actually a dress watch. Uh, it doesn't feel like much of a sports watch. And then you see all the details, like the high top crystal, the bezel, both bi-directional, no clicks. So Graham, thank you for sending these in. I mean, it's, it's so nice seeing this pair of the two together, 5508 five, all the way. Again, I'll say I wanted to make this the hero of the show. And the reason why is because it lines up directly with what I wear. I mean, there are the two watches side by side. For those of you who just joined, I, I run through this briefly for about five minutes. These two watches both made 57, 58, essentially the same. They were in direct competition with each other. We noticed just how much more dated this watch looks, I'll admit. This looks like a watch out the 50s. This has transitioned over time. The magic mouse working me here, sweetheart. Uh, it's nice seeing them together and just what changed over time. Yeah, I think they both have flaws and they both have you know pros and cons. Maybe I should do a video on that in the future. Getting back down, Freddie T, where are you? There we go. Another shot of his 55. 08 on a nice strap, 18th century. Let's have a look, he says here, 18th century clock. And I'm getting back to you all in the chats. I've missed a lot of you. GMT on Jubilee or Oyster, Kenneth asks. I am always someone for a GMT on a Jubilee over Oyster. Just because, I've said this so many times, I've probably like talked your ear off about this before. Uh, it's a pleasure, Charles. Thank you so much for joining. Um, I, I feel that the GMT is more of a dressy watch, designed for pilots, designed for people who were traveling in a very Lani, you know, class on planes back in the day when it was a new a new thing. Um, so the GMT, I think, really suits the Jubilee. The only GMT reference that I find deserves an Oyster is the CHNR root beer. I think it looks terrific on an Oyster because it's subdued, but you get that bling of the, the rose gold with the brown and that contrast. It's simple but really effective as, as a pairing. Um, so Bud Owens says, I don't know. I think they're both aged well. I compare your Seamaster to the 5508, the monstrosity that is Richard Mill. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Richard Mill is, uh, is definitely not everyone's cup of tea, for sure. I like to talk. I, I made a video about Richard Mill a while back. This is from John, by the way. Graham, thank you for sending in your 5508. So we chatted about it long and hard. Um, chatted about Richard Mill. I call it something like the, the bizarre... The bizarre design of Richard Mill watches, and I talk about brand ambassadors and just what they're trying to do, that the watches remind me of Lego Technic and my childhood, so that speaks to me. <laughs> Founder, thank you so much, James, sending me a dog as well, it's great. Uh, Chaitan saying, GMT was designed to be worn by people who dressed in hats, coats, and ties. Absolutely. But then it's such a contentious point. Look up my Sky Dweller video. That one, 
I, I call it Sky Dweller, a watchmaking masterclass. I hope to put it, I'll put it up on the, in the screen. If you want to replay it in the future, I'll be sure to link it. Um, the Sky Dweller was a watch that I believe was really, what Rolex really wanted to do in those days, more like a day date style for that time period. Uh, I, I, give, I give a good argument about the GMT and how the tonograph was influential to the, to the whole idea but also that it's not exactly the best thing for suits and dress. Anyway, uh, recommend you have a look at it. Uh, just type in uh, Sky Dweller, ID Guy Sky Dweller. I'm sure you'll see it. So in the beginning, at least five minutes, I give a good argument about what, how I believe that the GMT was arranged. So anyway, this is a, a reverser. I don't know the reference. Is this a grand? I would imagine. Got a subdial. Do enjoy the symmetry with this piece, and it's a great shot. We get to see it sitting neatly and comfortably on the wrist. Um, Gorgeous looking watch, nice presentation. So thank you for this, John. Great ostrich, absolutely. Ostrich trap, you can see uh, the, the what, do you, what would you call these things? Uh, knots, knots in the leather. Ostriches are the weirdest animals, I tell you. Coming out of Africa, South Africa especially, you see them all over the show. It looks too small to be a grand. Okay, okay, thank you, we watch guy. Okay, moving on, thank you so much for this, John. Next is Julian. Julian, thank you for sending these in. Uh, Julian is quite the diver. He loves it. I mean, he was always in the water. He's sent some great shots in the past. This looks like a no-date Submariner. Yeah, pretty much looks like a 114060. And he uses his watch as well. I mean, he this. I think he told me that this watch has seen like over a thousand, thousand dives in its life already. And he goes all over the place. I think he sent me a few more. Uh, here's another one. That... I mean, that is a photograph right there. Great in the action shot, as mentioned. It's so nice seeing this watch in its real habitat actually being used <laughs> in the sea deep down. I mean, I would, I'm would. i going to guess, well, it's pretty light. I would guess that this is about 25-ish meters, 25, 30 meters down, uh, possibly maybe. Not too deep, but still, oh, it just looks terrific. What, what wreck was this? Looks like a ship. Definitely looks like a shipwreck. You can see railing on the side. Oh, it's so nice. And the coral, really enjoying it. Gent. And then Julian all of a sudden decides to send. Uh, there's another shot. Here we go. He sends in his date just with a roulette wheel in a 58 bug that he clearly, I don't, he clearly hasn't modified by the looks of the, the pedals and everything else. It looks like it's all still the same original condition. You're a very brave man, <laughs> very brave man to drive an original 58. Uh, I, yeah, we can talk about that in a second. Um, great though, it's nice seeing the watch in its element and actually being used. I hope, I hope Julian is still in the chat. Um, and yet tons of guys take their subs off when they wash their hands. Yeah, Shaitan, it's, it's pretty hilarious, right? People are worried about their seals aging and everything. I mean, really, all of these dive watches, any watch that's certified to 300 meters, sorry, Magic Mouse is not the best. Any watch that's certified to depth can be used and abused and, you know, really enjoyed. You should enjoy your watches. You spend so much money on them, get the money's worth out of them. <laughs> that's what I say. Uh, gorgeous date just. I really enjoy the Alpha. We call these Dauphine or Alpha hands. Uh, gold on gold finish. And then a 58 Beetle. I really hope you've changed the shock absorbers in this piece, <laughs> in this car. Uh, you know, co put conies or put... Eibach or something on it to keep it keep it sturdy and stable. Anyway, going to carry on. Uh, there's just so many pieces still to go, and we're doing pretty well. We might actually be able to cap this off by three. Uh, no, probably not. Three hours, probably not. But I'll try. Have to try. Uh, loving to see a diver in its, ha in its habitat. Yeah, it's great. Uh, wait, the diver has a coral VW. <laughs> Good point. That is coral red, right? That is so funny, bud. Uh, and, and mentioned, if, if anyone knows your Beetle history, I just I was told this earlier that the 57 was the last with a split window at the back. So this is an oval 58. I mean, that 58s. I would love to get a 58 or a 59 and paint it, you know, gloss jet black with a burgundy interior. That would be me. And just have it a sleeper, you know, lower it, put a proper like 2.3 liter twin weaver carb engine in there. Uh, proper discs all around just you know they're they are awesome cars to drive there's something so special about driving a bug uh, that you don't get out of modern cars you really feel like you're involved in the experience you know 
Okay, so carrying on, let's see what else is going on here. It's nice that you're all chatting away. Coral, Redbug, Seiko Tuna was rated at 1,000, but recent tests show that it could actually, hold on, could actually surpass 4,000 meters, watch aficionado. That is amazing. That is amazing. I don't think there's a tuna on this show, but by all means, send me one. If anyone's watching and you have one, send me one, and I'll be sure to bring that up next week or whenever we do another one. Gilbert, thank you for joining. I think you've already uh, why did Watch Snob say? We did talk about this earlier, or have I have I just botched the chat? Let me refresh and see. So Matthew with another left-hand drive Pelagos, the, the cover girl for the show. Always nice seeing this piece in action, wearing it on her right wrist, where the crown's actually pointing to the to the hand. I don't understand who the left-hand drive is really marketed towards. You know, that's something you could um could emphasize and give me some details on. Uh, classic bug, no airbags, we die like real men in something, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, and and one th if anyone is out there buying yourselves a new beetle, uh, an old beetle, a classic beetle or a classic Porsche, do this and you will thank me for the rest of your lives. First thing to do, buy a MP, E-M-P-I shifter, proper shifter. Because the, the way that gear, the, the gear sticks worked on those cars back then, they were horrible, <laughs> rattly. Uh, and from Africa, we call them sudza sticks. You know, basically a stick used to stir your your milli your milli meal or your uh, your porridge, <laughs> because there's just no way for it to get into gear, right? Uh, so first thing is get a efficient shifter for the car. Thank me later. Next thing, proper suspension, because those vintage bugs, they knew how to roll very well with their old suspension. So if you can find proper shock absorbers from wherever, conies, whatever, and just equip them to the car, you're done. And then next step is, is disc brakes and drop the drop the front, put a whole new front section in the car and uh, put a strut at the back and anti-roll bar. And yeah, yeah, it just gets, you get deep into it eventually. You don't need to do much to make a, uh, a original bug or original Porsche work like a charm. And Bud Owens, MP had a drag bug that was canceled called the, oh, it was called the inch pincher. Yeah, they, uh, MP was, it's such a good, if anyone's in the chat, MP is is the performer part to get for your car. If uh, you enjoy, I've just put it in as well, if you're interested. And then a 911 engine. You don't have to, you don't need a, you don't need a six cylinder. Put a, put a two liter twin carb and you're sorted. Just big cams and uh, great car. Anyway, getting back in, Ray sent in a Seiko Paddy and this, this photo was, Something like 34 megs. Seiko Paddy SRP A21. This really is the, the modern uh, evolution of the turtle paddy, meaning that it is, in fact, you know, certified for diving instructors. Uh, it's all a part of that, that charm. It's got a great connection that way. And that's a great piece. I mean, it's, it's awesome entry level. You really get to enjoy it. And I love, love the contrast. Love the orange, the little orange highlight, the, the red accents. So I've actually done a video on this watch. I think if you look up Seiko Paddy Prospects, I've done a discussion about this piece and all the influence. Also, long story behind that. Next up, Russell. And thank you for this. This was from Ray. Thank you for sending this in. Next up from Russell. This is one of the heaviest hitters on the show. And if Zane is still in the chat, in the chat. <laughs> if Zane is still in the chat, he knows what is coming next. It's a very, very special Patek Philippe. Why is it so <laughs> well time time? Why is it so special? Well, Russell, from the time he placed his order until he received this piece, took eight years for him to wait for it to be made for him. And it is the reference 5131 Rose Gold R. Eight years to wait for this. So where do we begin? Hand painted enamel. This is one of, I mean, this Russell, here we go, but Owens. <laughs> I mean, this is what we come for, right? Uh, hand painted enamel. This is just the world time on steroids. I don't know the year that this piece and the best that this has the best rose gold map variant. Thank you for that, Zane. And I would imagine it's because it's centralized. The only part that's missing is, is Africa and part of Europe. It's really nice and well rounded. You get to see a much better globe layout. On the dial oh it's terrific right and all these little details i mean I've, I've never known patek to actually engrave their name on the case i would imagine this is a piece unique please zane by all means uh give us some more details about what makes this special how many 
of these were made because I would imagine there's only like 50 of them in the world. Um, I've never known Patek to actually engrave the bezels of these watches. And we move down, we also see that it says Geneva, the base. Oh, it's a gem. It's a gem. It's the world time on steroids. Also really enjoy uh, this, this hour hand and how it has that ring cut out in the center. Interesting. Very interesting. And then we have a better, now we have it on the wrist. Get a better understanding of it in the natural light. Sorry about the magic mouse. Has a mind of its own. Imagine waiting eight years for your watch to be made for you. And what was nice about the story is that he says he had a connection at the authorized dealer that allowed him to pick it up from the Patek factory. So he actually probably had a tour of the factory when he picked it up. So this really is a watch. I think of all the watches that he has shown or shared with us in the past. I mean, we've seen longer Zeitwerks, we've seen longer datagraphs, the whole deal. Um, this one is quite the commemorative watch and definitely holds a place in his heart. I haven't had a look at, uh, let's see, Zane saying no world time and were produced in a, were produced in a few hundred. Okay. Yeah, it really is art piece. This is one of the best watches on the show for sure. And just, I, this is what I love is that the light, how the light catches every continent. You get to see the outline. Just remember, this is all hand enamel painted and finished and glazed. And it's, it's not an easy process. It's an artwork in itself. World time. I think having a world time with the world in the center. Yeah, I mean, it's it's modern enough to be worn, but also pays tribute to that old school work that was done all those years back. Eight years, I'd rather wear a meager <laughs> towel. Yeah, well, I mean, some the passion the passion runs deep, and I hope hope we get that across in these shows. Hawaii in the center, I would imagine so. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah, this is nice. Thank you so much for this, Russell. Really a gem. Thank you for sharing it with all of us. Okay. You're in, you're in negotiation for one of these yellow gold. Wish me luck. GMT Master, good luck. I hope you get it. And uh, this, I said that this was an explorer. This is from Kem. Kem sent me, this is not, I don't know why. This, you know, as I'm renaming stuff, I do make mistakes at times. Uh, this is just your, this is a simple oyster petrol. We'll see more of these in a second, I think. Um, but this is a gorgeous piece. It's not your, it's just your standard oyster perpetual with a silver dial. Uh, Blue Luminova, you can tell it's not an explorer because it doesn't have an elongated triangle there at the 12. But it's always a pleasure seeing these watches glowing in the dark. Moving through, I mean, it's just nuts. We've got some more coming up. Uh, let's have a look from Kenneth. We have a 60s day date and a 58 date just. So here's a pairing. We've got some vintage pieces on show. And let me catch up with some of you because I've been I've been running. Eight years, that's worth it. Not like Rolex, two years, cruising gypsy. Well, geez, I mean... Uh, Russell says, I had to wait so long as was my first Patek. Okay. Thank you, Russell. Russell's in the chat. So this was his first Patek he ever picked up. What a watch to start with. <laughs> you know, end all, be all. Amazing. Um, yeah, it's, it's a treat. It's such a treat showing these off with everyone. Okay, carrying on. I need to catch up with all of you here. From 2012 to 2018, worked there. From Is that so, Albert? You worked for Patek? Need to hear more about this. I mean, I am, uh, <laughs> it's, it's mind blowing. The kind of people that you get to connect with on this platform on a daily basis. Um, anyway, I need to keep intact because now we're coming up to the three hour mark and we're doing pretty well. We only have about, I would say 25 watches to go. Pretty good. I'm going to turn this on its side so we get a better look. The, the one reference of the day date, I don't know if this is an 1803. Can you, someone let me know. Uh, the, 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 the solid gold with the gold dial 1803 or 1803 looks so good. Uh, the real um, Get Carter watch, you know, um, gorgeous, nice pairing, like seeing them together. And there's a few more from Kenneth, a group shot of them chowing. And we get to see first Omega in space. We get to see an engineer for a change. I haven't seen this, an engineer chronograph. And then across, we also have a 2254. Nice little group shot. Maybe we can make this a theme in future, like a group wrist shot, shot show <laughs> in something. Three hour mark, we're doing well. We only have two fatalities so far. <laughs> uh, it's unbelievable. I don't, you know, ladies and gentlemen, I'll tell you, I don't know how I run these shows for so long. Um, I, I don't want to be someone that just quickly flashes through the watches sent in because they need to be savored. There's some nice stuff that we can all see 
And sometimes it's good to linger, which is why they turn into be three hour long shows most of the time. Um, nice three way, <laughs> Buganish, thank you. Uh, yeah, great looking pairing. First Amiga in space again, another one. Suddenly we see this, Engineer Chronograph. I actually prefer this to the standard Engineer. Let me know uh, if you prefer this over the, the generic, because the generic is very, I think space, once again, it's, it's, down to, it's down to space and architecture and then the balance on the dial. All of those details play a, play a role. And the, the, I can just see how engineers placed. I like that they've used the vintage text here, uh, offset subdials. Cool, really nice. Or even the pushes. Go into the pushes and have a look how they also match the case, the bracelet. Similar styling all the way through, you know? Okay, so. Great, nice pairing, thank you for this. And finally from Kenneth, probably one of the best Grand Seikos that, that many gravitate towards because it's one of those watches that really captures the brand. It's simple enough that no one in their right mind would know what it is unless you're quite big in the hobby and you're an enthusiast. Um, and I'm terrible with references. I didn't actually save it on this, but it is Grand Seiko GMT. There's a few people that, that enjoy this watch so much that they could wear this for the rest of their lives. And yeah, you can agree. I think it's Grand Seiko with a bit of an X factor. It's not just your simple generic looking piece without any text or numerals on the dial, you know? I'm gonna get right in, it's a great shot. Cream finish as well with the brown strap and the blue hand, nice emphasis. Okay, let's have a look. The lockdown will be over before the end of the show. <laughs> Thank you, Julian. Oh, that's funny. Okay, so I'm going to carry on through this. We are doing pretty well. Going to Lane, and Lane sends in one of his prized possessions. This is a 1968 6105 Turtle. On, I mean, they call this the barbed wire bracelets, don't they? I mean, this looks like barbed wire. It looks like you could really slice your hand open. But here is an original, ladies and gentlemen, in fantastic condition. This is known as the Willard as I'm sure most of us probably know by now. Um, this watch has been around for a long time. It's the apocalypse now. Uncle Seiko, <laughs> that's, that's such a great name, Eric Bell. So uh, I don't know if that was, is that really what they call it as a reference? So uh, this is what was made famous during Apocalypse Now. It was also widely used in the Vietnam War. And I would like to discuss Vietnam watches for sure, because these were easy to obtain, obtain back then. Uh, very affordable, easy to grab and use. Razor wire, that's it, thank you. That's what they call this, the razor wire bracelet, something like that. And they just reintroduced, uh, apparently they did, yeah, Philly's dad, through through the Prospects line, they, they reintroduced the 62 MAS and this watch again. I really hope it sells well and people enjoy it. Um, something about the original though. It's, I think Seiko knows how to do their reissues pretty well. And this watch is definitely the icon. It really is important. This, this watch was the transition from the 62 MAS, which was basically a Blancpain Bathyscaphe knockoff. <laughs> they essentially look exactly the same, where this, all of a sudden, we had the turtle case, uh, all of the elements that we now know about these Seiko divers was first used with this watch. So it's, it's an important piece to the family, one that deserves a reissue. Now, they delayed. Of course, they delayed. <laughs> Watch aficionado. Carrying on through, we now have from Luke, Breguet Marine 5817. I'm so glad I get to feature a Marine on the show. Breguet Marine is a fascinating watch. I did a video on this as well. Where, what was it? It was the Titanium. Titanium Marine was a gem. Such a great video. Also recommend you have a look at it. I'll, uh, See if I can put it in the corner of the screen for future reference. Uh, the Breguet Marine Titanium, they, they've managed to not only play off those vintage elements from the marine chronometers back in the day, but also make it look like a sports watch. Also, keep the Breguet aesthetics. Still very much a dress-styled watch. Big date at the base. I mean, it just looks so intact, clean. Um, no, no batons or anything. We still have our Romans, but we have a loom hand, loom hour hands, and minute hands. We've got small loom plots at the outside. The minute track looks great. And then just the, the details like the, the straight lugs that we know from, from Breguet in general. Similar approach here. We have the straight lugs with screws at the top. Yeah, it looks so nice. 
very, very interesting piece. Reggae does have a design language all to themselves. And uh, Carlos, thank you so much for the super chat, man. Really, really appreciate it. And Marcello, welcome. I don't think I've shown your watch yet, but we're getting used to be just about to hit the three hour mark. This is going to be a, uh, a three and a half hour, I'm sure, at this point. <laughs> um, yeah, so this, I mean, I could I could talk for hours about Breguet and just how they how they've managed to remain relevant with their designs, uh, still keep to that heritage. They know what they're doing. Anyway, I'm going to carry on. This is from M. Boo. He sent this in as, under the name of M. Boo, and it's a reference one six seven five zero. I hope. I really hope you can you can tell me. Um, but this was obviously last week because uh, this was the show. We had a data graph. Recommend you watch that again. Similar show to this. We just we just ran through so many references. Oh no! Come back, Magic Mouse. Nice patina on the dial. You get to see those plots. We get to see the bezel is fading ever so slightly to pink. And I'm going to catch up with you all in the chats. Let's do it. The indices kill it, as Charles says. I'm a I'm a blue bath scarf. Okay, great. Recent generation is terrible. We can have a look. I'd, I'd like to look more into the, the family of the Marine line. It's definitely a, a niche watch for sure. And Charles, I'd love to see some of your pieces. The, the Bathyscaphe, it's a watch that I've uh, said often I really don't enjoy. I don't find the aesthetics great, but it'd uh, be nice to see it. If you could send it in, love to share it with everyone else. Uh, the chronograph of the Bathyscaphe, I think, is a gem. And some of the, the original Bathyscaphes were great. Uh, yeah, we can talk about that at length in the future, but great looking pieces here. Um, to see, uh, Philly's dad saying, may I ask in all seriousness, why do you keep using the magic mouse? And the reason why is that pinch to zoom is so useful. I can come right in, right out with no no worries. And it's a pain when you're dealing with a, a mouse generally, you know, handheld. The magic mouse is good. It, it's, it has its, its perks, but then it also does sometimes act a little bit strangely. Um, Love the new Barracuda. There's so many in, in the Blancpain line that deserve a lot more attention. Uh, the military-inspired Blancpains are just amazing. The, the Barracuda was for the Polish military, no? Um, what do I think about the Cartier crash from Marcello? Let me just move on to the next piece. Thank you, Embu, for this. Um, Marcello sends in, this is your watch, Marcello, uh, Helios Seaforth. This is one of the most fascinating micro brands out there today, I believe. They've done some great things with their dial designs, the, the colors they've decided to use. Cartier Crash is fantastic. Got the magic trackpad just for that purpose. Please, that's what I mean. Sorry, I'm using a magic trackpad. That's what I call it a magic mouse. Ugh. You know, I'm an industrial designer and I don't even know Apple product. How bad is that, right? <laughs> uh, I hate tech. It's just not my thing. Um, so Marcello asking about the crash. I think it is stunning. Really interesting story. Uh, Basically, an, an owner, his his wife's watch. They had a there was a car crash or something in their house, and he returned the watch to Cartier, who then made a mold of it and have turned this into it. It's a real art piece. Marcello is an industrial designer, and yeah, I think for an industrial designer, a, a tank crash, a Cartier crash, is incredible. Go for it as a Grail watch. Go for it. And Jeffrey finally made it. Welcome to the show. I hope uh, hope you're seeing and hearing everything okay. And there was a question here from. From R Jack 001. How's the Omega going? I love it to bits. I've mentioned it too often already on the show. And uh, yeah, uh, we'll, we'll stick we'll stick with that. Uh, but I, I'm, I haven't taken it off in a year and a half at this point. I was just about to say, B Dev, nice placement of automatic. How nice is that for a change? Actually being able to split it on either side and no superfluous details on the dial. Um, yeah, so Helios, have a look at the brand. They've they've done some great things with their approach. Uh, I think a few have spoken about it before. It's a watch that's been featured around, but they really play with color very well. They understand what they're doing. Next, thank you for this, Marcello, from Mark. And it is a 2001 Zenith El Primero Rainbow flyback. And he's just uh, observing his little one killing the train set. <laughs> Now this watch is quite a gem. I'm just having a look at, was there any more details that he gave me here? No, rainbow flyback, exciting watch. Love the numerals. Uh, we've we've mentioned so many El Primeros on the show in the past, no? It's amazing just how, uh, <laughs> 
how how popular it is in this community, whether you like the, the newer vintage, whether you like the reissues. And here's another example, a real workhorse. This looks like something you could take into a war zone, sword hands, orange highlights, do really enjoy the numerals. And then we have a look at the, the subdial. Great color choice. We've got orange here at the 20. So not only do you have a rotating bezel, is this really a flyback chronograph? Amazing. Really good looking piece. I also enjoy the gradient, the gradiated bezel and all of those details. Nice bracelets. Yeah, it's stunning. It's terrific. Um, it's, uh, I really enjoy the variety. That's why I love these shows because you really don't know what's coming up next. It's Russian roulette. And that's the joy of doing this. Good Canadian content, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. J. Um, okay, I'm gonna carry on through. Thank you for this, Mark. Next from Matt. Now, this was interesting, a VC movement uh, that he sent in. This was just in for a service. And it is from a 1940s Vacheron Constantine. Gorgeous looking watch. So let's just have a look at the movement in more detail. It's incredible to think, 1940, and the movement still looks like this. Hey, I mean, it's incredible just how well they last. And to the actual watch itself, isn't that cute? That looks so good. Love the cleanliness on the dial. It reminds me of an IWC actually, you know, vintage IWCs from the time. I would not, I would not be surprised if this said IWC on the dial, but you get such a good understanding of the relationship between the hands indices. I, I love a dial that just has indices all over it. There's one, the, the one uh, Oyster Perpetual that was worn to cross the channel, it had all indices around it. If you read a man and his watch, you'll know the, the watch I'm telling, I'm talking about. Uh, cute, <laughs> Buganish. Yeah, it does. I mean, it's a 33 mil watch. I mean, what can you say? It looks looks gorgeous and cute. Uh, stunning. I would imagine it's, it's a 1940s piece. It has to be a 33 mil. Maybe it's a 36. Was this a pilot watch? Don't know. Need to know more details. But basic, simple, elegant, how dress watches should be. Robert asking, uh, what do you think of Unimatic watches? I'm, I'm just uh, drawing a blank. Unimatic are those watches that have the, uh, the the oil inside them, right? Please correct me. I don't want to go on a tirade about a, a brand or a talk <laughs> if I'm mistaking the brand. Unimatic, if I remember right, is the brand with the oil inside, the full oiled up movement. Um, Amazing complication. I mean, it really is something very special. Has that hand in the center. I think that's the, the one the one detail. Um, no, those are another brand. Really, we watch guy. Sorry, I'm drawing a blank. Uh, I need to do another show which is more topic-based instead of just running through uh, wrist shots because when I'm, those are resins. Thank you, we watch guy. Um, Unimatic, I can't for the life of me think of the brand off the top of my head. Sorry about that, but we will. Definitely, Zen also has oil-filled watches. Yeah, I mean we can just talk about watches for days and days, and you know, three hours in, still going strong. Bluesy Submariner. I think uh, Matthew said this was his stroll, getting out of the house today, using his allotted time wisely. You know, um, you, you can't go wrong with this watch. I still really enjoy the five-digit references of this piece. I would gladly pick up one. Um, as far as Rolex subs go, it's it's really that blend of dress, of sports, of its time period, um, but it's also pretty, it's, it's amazing how this watch has transitioned up until the modern modern era now, and still is as desired and enjoyed by so many. Great looking watch. Thank you for this, Matthew. Still rocking and rolling. Let's carry on. From Max, we have an Aquaterra Loom. This was the only Aquaterra. We've, we haven't featured an Aquaterra in a long time. Um, great symmetry on the dial. Another awesome watch, just for everyday wear. Let's see, uh, Shaitan's saying Unimatic are Italian-made microbrand watches with Seiko movements. I need to look at them more. That's probably why I botched it, because I just haven't haven't looked up the name well enough. And Amar saying, I enjoy one, I wear one, and enjoy it well. Talking about the bluesy, yeah, it's just great. It's just a great, everyday, versatile, simple piece you can enjoy, uh, with a bit of flash to it as well. It's not so much understated. You know, it has a bit of character behind it too. Um, really enjoy this shot from Max. We get to see all the doom, all the lighting, nice bit of mood. And uh, the Aquaterra I've often critiqued because it's just too symmetrical. But again, love the fact that it draws on so many vintage motifs. Again, Seamaster styled hands and uh, 
it's another sport. And you compare this to the constellation, you can see quite a difference. I hope to do that in this in this constellation write up that I'm working through. And thank you for the super chat, James. Final time is capital. It's an absolute pleasure. Um, as always, the ID tribe, <laughs> stay safe. Uh, don't touch your face. Yeah, absolutely. I, as as I'm reading this to you, I'm actually touching my face, which is terrible. Uh, it's a bad habit. That's what masks are great for. They they teach you not to touch your face. Okay, next from Max. I think this is a, this is a different Max. If I'm not wrong, I have never seen this piece before, but I find it fascinating. It's called a McDowell Time Maxton. Is this a micro brand? I do not know. Someone let me know if anyone has seen this piece before. But we have a cushion case, we have orange highlights, we've got 70s inspired motifs, uh, black on white, panda aesthetic. I have never seen this format before, but it looks great. Hey, very peculiar. I mean, it's it's definitely, it's an, it's an amalgamation of, of vintage, like what, vintage 30s and 40s to 60s together. It's this clash, peculiar. Thank you, Junior Johnson. I really hope you're doing well. I haven't seen you much in the chat. Uh, that's not not by choice. I'm uh, <laughs> I'm just scrolling, just scrolling through. Um, <laughs> Mr. Perpetual, I think voices his opinion on this piece. <laughs> That's funny. And then moving through, thank you for this, Max. I really like the contrast. Nice use of colors there. Next is Arado. It's another brand that's been uh, pushed out a lot. It's it's a watch that you always see at an airport. And I don't know much about the brand at all. I know the Captain Cook is loved it was one of the original divers, the commercial divers, you know, uh, and it's called, a, this is called a D-Star R1576202. I mean, talk about a mouthful. <laughs> uh, nice and clean, clear, simple, basic. I like it, different. <laughs> Thanks, bud. Uh, so it's nice. Thank you for this, Max. And Thomas, as always, thank you so much for the super chat, brother. I still haven't gotten back to your email. I'm uh, I'm really considering taking a week off next week because I've just dedicated so so much time to the page that it's disgusting. Too many hours. Be nice to just take a week off from watches completely and just not think about them in the slightest. Next though, this is from Maz, and I really hope you're still here, Maz, because you've wanted this shown for a while. J uh, date just one two six two three four, and I mean it's a gem. As far as date, date justs go, this is quite the character. We've got a fluted bezel, jubilee bracelet, black charcoal dial with a bit of sunburst to it. It's a gem. Really is so nice. This is how I believe the date just should be. The one detail that I would like to, that if I wanted to change this watch, the one detail I'd like is a roulette window. I don't know if this has a roulette wheel, but that is, to me, one of the stealthiest date, date justs out there. Can't say date just anymore. I need to take another hit. I think I need to hit some water. Great looking watch. So subtle, but also a real character. You know, it embodies all the parts that you want to see from a date just. You have the Jubilee, you have the fluted bezel, the large Cyclops. It's just great. So, Maz, thank you for sending this in. Uh, doesn't have a roulette, unfortunately. Ah, yeah, that's the one element I'd love to see on this watch. But I mean, it's, it is terrific. As far as Rolex goes, you want a date just. The watch that really epitomizes, you know, it's great. Just when you talk about watchmaking and its history, very important. Okay, I need some espresso. I do. I mean, I'm slowing down. We're already over three hours at this point. I'm going to keep pushing through. From Mason, he sent this in last week, and I'm so glad you did because it's a great shot. So, as I, I just, I was looking at the background, trying to make out what this was. This is the Star Trek ship. I'm not a Star Trek junkie, so forgive me. But I see this is the schematic. For the star trek ship the background is superb and it's just a, a gorgeous shot of a navy timer on a fin straps cognac i think it's a cognac uh, leather strap and you really get to enjoy the dial and all the details here this to me is the navy timer the reference is a23322 it looks uss enterprise thank you bud i am i'm didn't grow up during Star Trek time. It was never my my jam. I'm a Star Wars junkie more than Star Trek. Beam me up, Scotty. Yeah, <laughs> uh, my dad was big on Star Trek. I never caught on the in the early nineties. Um, so Navi Timer A two three three two two. This is the embodiment of the modern Navi Timer. I believe it looks so great. If Mason's still here, thank you for sending this in. We get to see the blue highlight. We get to see the gold, the red accents. Slide rule. How often you use a slide rule on a bezel? Yeah. I uh, do not know, 
And uh, I mean, that's that's really the one element that you either love or hate with a Navi timer as it is. Anyway, I'm going to carry on through. We're doing pretty well. Almost ending up the show. Mike Hoplite sends us a loom shot, another loom shot. How many loom shots have we seen of the Explorer today? <laughs> it's crazy, right? So this is a Gen 1. This is the 214270. Before it received its full uh, full uh, numeral placement with the loom. Um, so white gold layout of the battle, the, the numeral plots. And yeah, it's a gem. It's a great watch. And many people appreciate this over the, the, the modern one with the T-Rex hands and all the little things that that many people don't enjoy with this watch. But, you know, going to carry on. I need to say hi to you in the chat if there's any more. Another Explorer. It's nuts, right? I mean, we've, we've seen at least five or six during the show. I mean, uh, and T-Rex, yeah. T-Rex hand, for those who don't know, the handset in this model was used for the 39mm variant when it was released. And uh, it was taken directly from a 36mm model, which was remedied, we could say, whether, whether you like it or not, uh, with the 39 Mark II, the second generation that then had the full loom 369 layout. We talk about Explorers way, way too much. And you th this Mark I will be sought after in 20 years, for your dad said. Yeah, I agree with you. I think it's going to be a popular one because it's it's one of those, you could say, quote unquote, rejects from the family at the time. Um, moving through, still got more to go. Nick, Seamaster Professional 300. I think he said he was in Chicago and it's just started snowing there. And uh, yeah, it's great seeing this watch in the snow being used. Uh, let's catch up. Truth here is ending. Well, we've been running for over three hours at this point. Three hours, seven minutes to be exact. <laughs> and uh, it's uh, it's pretty it's pretty amazing that I can keep going up until this point. Who knows? I might conk out completely as the show happens. Um, error hands. Well said, bud. So they, many consider these to be error hands, as if you know the hands were wrong put on this watch. And for that reason, collectability will skyrocket over time. All open to interpretation. The second, I mean, I could say it's going to be extremely collectible, and so people grab onto the idea. <laughs> Zane, the stream just started, get settled in. You're a character, Zane. Um, so this is a great shot. Thank you for this, Nick. Nice seeing this watch in the snow. The blue on blue, I mean, this is the James Bond watch of the modern era, really is a character. Nice piece. And something next, if he's still here. This watch I debated so often and said it has to be the cover photo. It should have been. In hindsight, I think this should have been the cover photo because it is just gorgeous. I th this should be one maybe for next week or whenever we do another one of these shows. Uh, this is before seeing the Longines sector watch that came out of this is the, the JLC sector master control. And uh, it's stunning. When you talk about the blue highlights and accents, I've talked about the whole series of this at length. Highly recommend you have a look. I've also reviewed N Something's collection and he loves his JLC. He has three separate pieces, all look fairly similar and the same, but I mean, as a package, also love the shot. This looks like an Aram Lily in the background, don't know, but just as far as presentation goes, oops. If you want a watch featured as a cover photo, that's the way to do it. You wanna get a full wrist shot in with a bit of sleeve so I can actually put the, the title on the side. Seems to be what we, we're doing. It's like a theme now at this point. And the hands, as mentioned, skeletonized, uh, syringe hands, just gorgeous. It's a really contemporary looking piece, modern, but also vintage. You know, it keeps that retro charm, but also manages to step into the modern era. It's a classic. I think it's going to be one that's going to last a long time. Now, this was from, I think it was also from Ray. I can't remember, but uh, Rajko, that's what I've written your name. It was going to be Rajko. I probably was, it's probably two in the morning when I saved this. And it's a Hamilton Kharki field officer. Awesome pilot watch. And you can see where it takes its cues. I mean, we've got these cathedral-esque style hands, uh, huge, huge numerals. And what makes the khaki so unique is the way they incorporate their 24-hour dial. Very military. You're, you're uh, watering orchids. <laughs> Thank you, and something. <laughs> um, very military-inspired dial with your 24-hour time. You've got your 5-minute, 10-minute, 15 on the sides. It's it's definitely saying it's an officer watch for sure. It really is one that speaks to that that situation, stance, great piece, very legible. Um, <laughs> truth fears, Williams, 
think he's still there. I don't know. You guys are just debating and having a chat. Sorry if I'm avoiding you in the chat. I'm uh, I'm running through all these pieces. If I do miss you, apologies. Uh, next from Ray. Thank you for this. And next from Ray is a Speedmaster Mark II, and I just adore this watch. Apologies. Trackpad gets in the way. Look at that thing. So this is obviously a reissue. We know this because it's loomed. It has a date window at the base. It says coaxial on the dial. These watches are, the originals are still going for amazing money online at the moment. If you can find one on eBay, you can spend a, a small amount and get a great watch. Uh, send it into Amiga, get it serviced, and the piece will just last you forever. What I love so much about the Mark II, this variant, the modern one, is that you have a fully loomed tachymeter, which you never see, you know? Um, loomed hands. You can also tell that this is a, a modern piece because it has a loomed orange hand. The originals just had a straight orange hand. Made a great video on this as well. Talked about this being a watch that looks like it belongs in 2001, A Space Odyssey. And uh, yeah, it's great. Integrated bracelets, solid case. It's a very beefy watch, as mentioned. Uh, Race, I mean, look at the yeah, race track. Talking about the, the minute track, racing dial. This watch really epitomized the racing dial back in the day. It's a shame that they never caught on. And now that I say that, I'm sure it's going to get so much popularity over time. Um, yeah, I, I'm definitely pro Mark II. I think the Mark II should get a lot more attention. These especially. I mean, the orange highlights. They're just, they're just awesome. Really exciting pieces. And then it's crazy how the originals don't cost much, as we watch guy says. Okay, moving through. Thank you for this, Ray. Next from Ricardo, another Black Bay 58. This one on the same rubber B strap that we saw earlier. I hope I'm saying it's a rubber B and not an Everest or whatever else. But uh, the texture's there, very similar to the olive one that we saw earlier. Great photo. Look at that texture. Get to see every little detail on the dial. Wow, this is fantastic. I'm going to leave this here and say hi to the chat. We're doing good. Time check. We'll be finishing at half past at this point. Pretty great. 39 mil. We're talking about the, uh, the Speedy. The, the Speedmaster, I think, is it's 42. Pretty sure, actually. Um, okay. Gorgeous. Stylized beyond, no doubt, but gorgeous. Uh, talking about talking about the uh, Mark II. Yeah. It definitely is a watch of its time. By no means has it transitioned out of the 70s, but interesting watch, nonetheless. Um, so thank you for this, Ricardo. Black Bay 58. Can't ever go wrong with this watch. It's great. It's a nice entry-level piece. Next from Richard. Jeez, I can't believe it. We're still, it's still going with these pieces. I haven't seen a Yacht Master in a long, long time. Oh, Shy Town, first Megan Space, 39. And if I'm not wrong, when they say 39, they actually mean more like 38.6. They're kind of rounding it up. Correct me if I'm wrong there. Um, so Richard sends in a 40 mil yacht master, platinum bezel. I mean, this is just the character. This, I find, is just such a 90s watch, you know, really calls back to that time. And it's beautiful. I love the I love the way how it's just almost matte. You know, it doesn't shout too much. It's like the the more jazzed up Polar Explorer in a way. Um, and this is the Charlie Sheen watch. We saw this on Two and a Half Men, the 35 mil variant. And uh, this was one of the watches in the running when I was doing my short list of watches that I wanted as a first watch. I think this is a stunning piece just because it's so low slung, simple. I would imagine this is the modern variant, so it's 40 mils, but the details are just great. You have, you have highlights and accents like the red yacht master, the red seconds hand. It's always a treat. Great seeing this piece. So thank you for this, Richard. I'm sure there's some talk too big. Tiger's blood, <laughs> but Owen, oh, this is the Tiger's, okay, from now on, we're going to call this the Tiger's blood yacht master. That's fantastic. What a great, you guys, you know, if I was in the chat with all of you, if I was actually commenting with all of you here, the one liners, I think that's what makes the live stream chat so great. Sorry that I can't always refer to them all the time, you know? Okay. From Sebi, check at this. This is a Retropunt Luminor 1950. That is one Stunning looking piece. I mean, the way they've integrated the pushes into the crown guard protector system. And I, I don't I don't appreciate the big 1950 scroll on the dial, but as far as just a, a diving chronograph goes, Ratchet Punt as well, it's it's a cool looking piece. And this mention saying, no, that's too big from Zane. I would imagine this is what, like 44-ish mils, 
nice composition though. I, I enjoy the, the the leather strap and the the balance on the dial. You very seldom you just see balance on dials nowadays, and everything's loomed. You actually get to see what's going on in the dark. The sub seconds, the thirty minute counter, retro point, meaning you can uh, reset the hand while it's still running. No, it's kind of like a flyback, but you can also use it while it's going. You can correct me there. I'm not much of a watch guy <laughs> when it comes to movements. Uh, tiger blood. Everyone's just going full tiger blood in the chat. It's fantastic. Uh, Luminor bottle opener. Oh, it looks like a good bottle opener for sure. I mean, that can do some damage. They, they really are rugged pieces, you know, really do hit. And Panny Dial is impressive. It's just nice seeing the balance. Uh, 56.5 millimeters. Is that so, bud? I don't know. Answer him in the chat. Great looking watch. I really enjoy the symmetry. Uh, Panerai does do some some nice things. Funny how they've also incorporated Panerai at the base of the dial. All sorts of peculiar things. Nice looking watch though. Thank you for the Sebi. He also sent in an Air King. Wow. Okay. Sent in an Air King that we now know as the watch that was made to sell the uh, the gold numerals. <laughs> so funny. It's funny how that. Uh, that changed just as the the second generation explorer arrived the 214270 so we see uh this piece released and I, I actually hate the fact that the air king is on the back burner because it has an amazing history and it was a watch designed for aviation pilots for raf pilots in the 50s and, and mason says sausage dial i didn't mention that absolutely so this is not your sandwich dial sausage dial meaning that the loom plots are actually puffy and on top of the dial important to note it's actually a very important thing for panerai people uh you can see that the six is nice and round it's not laminated it's actually stuck right on top it looks great so, so this is a reissue i'd imagine that this is a mil spec piece actually and it's one of the best i've seen honestly one of the best panerais i've seen in recent years love to see it on an olive drab strap or something also enjoy where the pusher is at the base here great looking watch and then we see this on a on an oyster or on a rubber strap a very divisive piece uh, the one watch that i've this this model in particular one of my earliest videos i i addressed one detail that i really found so peculiar with the way they did the dials on this watch and for those who have been longtime viewers of the page you you'll be able to point it out uh, if any i'm sure if anyone thomas burnett knows what i'm going to mention when talking about this dial layout if i'm sure some of you will probably also highlight it Everyone hates the egg. <laughs> it's nice. Three hours in, must have missed my pieces. Jeffrey probably did. Yeah, Jeffrey zero five. That's it. You you must be you must be new to the. You must have. Yeah, yeah. It's great. There's lots of people saying the zero five. So what I just don't understand with this watch, every single numeral on the dial, 10, 20, 25, 35, 40, You notice that they have two numerals linked together. Why would you not just add a zero here by the five to line up and correspond with the 55? For someone who has OCD, I mean, look at that gap difference. Oh, gets to me, man. Really bugs me. <laughs> Needs to have a zero five. Is that so difficult to achieve? Anyway, I mean, it's, it's a character. Nice to see that they've used yellow and green. They've really just thrown everything at the wall to see what they could do with this watch. It looks like an instrument cluster, which is pretty commendable. Uh, but uh, everyone everyone hates <laughs> the Air King by the looks of things. Yeah, it's definitely polarizing. Anyway, moving on. Sebi, thank you for sending these in. Soda is next with his Seamaster 300 with the silver dial, the, the mark, the Goldberg. You can call this the Goldberg Seamaster at this point. <laughs> and uh, he's got a it's French NATO strap going on here. And this was queued up for last week's show. He also sent in a loom shot almost directly afterwards. And one of the best complaints I've seen about this piece is that the uh, the loom dot itself loses charge very quickly, which is pretty poor, if you ask me. Um, it's it's just wrong. I mean, how can you have a loom plot? I mean, that's the, the one essential element of this piece that needs to you know help you when it comes to timing your dive or just dive timing or anything else just in general. Uh, peculiar why they didn't fill it with more loom for its purpose and its function. Um, why French? Why not Dutch? Yeah, you're right. I mean, turn it the other way. Truth fears. <laughs> uh, you might be completely wrong. I might be wrong. You might be right. Uh, so Mason says, talking about the Air King, I bet the designer tried 05 in that Air King on his computer before 
plumbing plump, plumping for the single digits would like to know his thinking yeah I, i'm afraid I, th I think most of these watches are not designed by an individual but more like a committee uh, there's it's not just one person solely working on these pieces um anyway i'm going to carry on through we're doing well and we're going to go past the half an hour mark at this rate if i don't hurry up <laughs> sixto sends in a boulevard now i did not name this i don't know what the reference is but it is a boulevard with an open work what would we call this piece um i think the designer of the air king was drunk <laughs> Buganish might be right there i mean they probably had to push it out really fast and they just guessed what they were doing so yeah six toe with a boulevard open work i don't know anything about this piece but i need to talk about the brand this tuning fork is quite the characteristic element of the family and the history they have an amazing history they're vintage pieces the tuning fork yeah absolutely um nice to see some open work don't see that much with watches definitely breaks up the eye i don't know if everyone appreciates it very much <laughs> we're gonna you're really nailing it today thank you uh we're gonna move on thank you for the six though uh suram sends in a longines automatic flagship and uh, yeah we're doing pretty well we're, we're running through these pieces i'm going to speed up a little bit more with these last few because uh i i've been going for a while i definitely need to hit the hay it's coming up to to one it's past 1 a.m in the uk at the moment i'm sure most in europe are asleep at this point um like the symmetry on this piece i would imagine that this watch was around in and around the the, the 30s the 40s and flagship i'm getting trying to get this mouse to pick up the dial you've got a sub seconds right here the the, the hour hands and the, the minute hands in the way but really nice and clean simple approach you have date window that's well centered and spaced got these gold batons gold hands Nice looking watch. So thank you for this, Shiram. I think one of his watches was a a Ming Ming copper that we featured earlier, a couple of couple of episodes ago. Next from Steve. This is a Laco Flieger Topper edition. Now Topper is a branch. Don't crucify me. It's a branch in California. If I'm not wrong, it's a jeweler, and they only made a couple hundred. Generally, the Topper editions are in small numbers, and they normally always signify it with a white detail. So great looking piece, Steve. Thank you for sending this in. And Larco, as a brand, we know, amazing history. Uh, one of the, the original Flieger pilot watch makers for the, uh, the Nazis and the forces at the time. It's only half past two. No, oops. <laughs> it's only half past 20 past eight Eastern Standard Time. You guys are lucky. It's, yeah, it's currently, what, 23 past one in the UK. <laughs> yeah i'm uh it's it's good though i prefer i much prefer later hours running these shows because it gets me to sit, settle down a bit more last week i tried at 9 p.m in the uk and it was a little bit too quick for me i preferred i prefer a little bit of a later delayed sequence who needs sleep as zane says yeah i mean design school they always say sleep is for the dead Larco is good, but check out Stover, founder says. I mean, they both they both are interesting. They both use very similar movements. I think they modify them ever so. They're ETAs or they the Manias or Velju. I really don't know that much. But I mean, they've they've transitioned pretty well over time, considering what happened over time and uh, how the companies were divided up. Okay, I'm gonna carry on. This is from Steve. I don't know if this is the same Steve, might be. Planet Ocean, another one of these that we featured earlier. Uh, 2006 era reference uh, nice looking piece it really is such a character I mean they, they leave open nines and open sixes you got to commend a brand that does that sort of stuff okay carry on I think this is also from Steve system 51 this might be a different Steve and the system 51 is something that I'm warming up to don't really understand the brand very much what they did here uh, do appreciate that they have made this watch completely by a machine it's all assembled by a machine. And I can see that they've tried to play with Bauhaus elements here with not only the numerals and the dial layout, but also the handset. Red, blue, and yellow are very characteristic components of the Bauhaus movement. All we're missing is uh, green, which I would probably have expected to see at the date, but who knows, funky colors, yeah. And all of these little screws here are basically whatever you would call these. Do they indicate where the rubies are on the movement? Something like that. I, I haven't looked into the System 51 much, but there are some great looking watches. Uh, not, I don't know how 
All of them are. Some are a bit more peculiar. This definitely looks like the Bauhaus reference. Oh, there we go. Wow, that's cool. So we get to see the movement in a bit more detail. Again, what makes this so unique is that it was assembled entirely by a machine, which many <laughs> zits, <laughs> which many don't appreciate. They like the idea that it's handmade and hand assembled. But uh, impressive how technology is moving forward. And Swatch, pretty much, you know, they they were one of the brands that had quite a torrid time, or they, they were one of the big brands that really made a big name in the industry during the 70s and the 80s, and they've bought out virtually everyone at this point. You've got to know that it's patented. It's important. 51 parts as well. Thank you, Thomas. <laughs> Many just, it is, it is definitely a, a divisive watch. Many don't appreciate. Okay, getting through, we've got a few more and some great watches to come. This is from Talal. This is what he's been wearing lately. And AP Chrono, Nautilus, and this is a chronograph. This is also a dual time. It's a, it's a local, it's a, what is travel time? That's it. It's a travel time chronograph. I, you know, me and my references. I didn't actually include the references here, but these two pieces are really heavy hitters. It's great seeing them. And there's also, it looks like a Rolex that he cut out. I would imagine this was a Daytona, but uh, nice seeing this pairing. I featured this a few times on the show and some great watches. I mean, I mean, this, this dial layout, I think this aesthetic is stunning. The blue on silver effect, it's just gorgeous. And this piece, this has been famously worn by Charlie Sheen. He loves his Pateks. As far as Nautili go, he loves this one. And it's, as, as a travel time, you have these two pushes that you can use to adjust your local or your home time, but also an in, inbuilt chronograph, quite a step above. Also, what I like about this reference is it doesn't look like much of a Nautilus. It's actually very subdued. You wouldn't actually believe this was a Patek Nautilus because of its its dial layout. Um, no, no double batons in the center makes it look very peculiar. Also enjoy the fact that there's no date or anything like that. It's just clear date window. It's nice that there's a wheel. Yeah, great looking watches. Nice pair. Thank you so much for sending these in to Lull. I can't believe we're still rolling. I'm so glad you're all enjoying this still. Going to carry on here. This is from Tarek and it's Orient Mako. Now, Tarek is a huge IWC lover. He always shares them with us. And this time, he decided to go cheap and cheerful. And it's good to see. I uh, got some sunburst finish. He really caught the light nicely here. Great highlight. It's, uh, it's a cool-looking piece. It's, it's a transitional. It's a watch that you get into the hobby with, you know, next to Seiko's and all the rest. Um, and I think he sent another one in, in an off-light. You get to see it a bit better. Many like this watch just because it's it's something you throw on and just use and wear hard, you know, beat it around. The new SKX, yeah, absolutely, founder. Um, it's definitely a popular watch in the community. Uh, I have a ridiculous Orient for next week. Thank you, Philly's dad. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's a peculiar watch for sure. Uh, the sword hands are nice. I think it's quite commendable. We have the 12369 layout that we enjoy. But uh, Orient, after just looking at AP and, and Nautiluses and everything else, yeah, we're going to move on. Thank you, Tariq, for this. Next is an Omega Seamaster, Seamaster GMT on a mesh. Don't see this comp combination much. Looks like he's on AstroTurf as well. <laughs> um, I have a, yeah, so I've just read that already. And check this out. Let's get another wrist shot. How often do we see these pieces on mesh bracelets? This, the Seamaster GMT is a popular watch in our community. It's one of those pieces that many enjoy. Uh, just because of the complication. Again, one detail that I found strange with these models is just that whole family, the 2254 line. The bezel insert, I feel, is a little bit too heavy. But other than that, great seeing this polar aesthetic, you know, black lines, outlines. The sword hands look superb on this watch. And uh, the mesh bracelet really does complete it. Makes it look very interesting. Old school. You could say old school. And notice something else. I think this must have been a flawed model or something, but something's missing here that should be here. <laughs> it looks infinitely better without the helium release valve. I think it's uh, it's great. Um, could take on the Explorer 2. If that's exactly what it's competing with. You're right, Tal. I didn't even think about it. This is what it's competing against, really. Replace this aluminium with a stainless steel bezel that rotates, and you have quite the monster. Also, texture dial. Thank you for that, Emma. Uh, you get to see all the little waves. Black, black on white highlights, red accents. 
nice looking watch great balance there and nice shot as well thank you for these photos tetley also so nice seeing it on a mesh bracelet a proper genuine omega mesh looks great it's always nice showing these diverse pieces and then we get to too old for two wheels don't know if he's still yes he is just right there uh casio oak blackout so we've just transitioned from Patek to Casio. Don't worry, we always end up with Zane's watch at the end of the show. And um, that's always the, the end all be all for all of us. So Casio Oak, love it or hate it. It's a great piece to just wear around. I really enjoy the fact that they are now using auto, you know, proper analog hands on the dials. Uh, does, it does clean up the aesthetic. It speaks to the watch enthusiast. I think uh, just general G-Shocks that don't have hands doesn't speak to me anywhere near as much as a watch that has a handset. You don't see any ticking seconds. Uh, it's a nice watch for that reason, I believe. Uh, moving on. Zanes are worth more than my house. Yeah, you and me both. Too old for two wheels. Rocking, this is his next submission, a Citizen Field Watch, and he's wearing it on a RAF-style NATO. What else does it say here? Yeah, Citizen Field Watch. Mustard yellow. Looks like we've got a, so this is a, a JDM variant. And this looks just like a Flieger. You know, they've taken, they've taken the aesthetic from the Flieger, shrunk it down. I don't know much about Citizen as a brand, but uh, interesting looking piece. Nice yellow highlight and accent. Some more from him. We've got a Gerard, oh, this is gonna be good. So Gerard's Denison, Denison Aquatite, made in England. Now, this is what, he highlighted basically something along the lines of uh, this has to do with Smith's and the Smith's name and the brand. And these pieces were very much in line with each other back in the day. Uh, let me get another shot of the Girard. Nice looking piece. I would imagine kind of late 50s, early 60s, two old or two wheels. If you'd like to, to mention more about uh, this watch, that would be great. And Philly's dad saying, called my dog uh, Zilly. <laughs> Come after Patek's for my sake as an audience. <laughs> That's funny. Um, also enjoy that the, the numerals are all just there on the dial. There's nothing cut away. It's nice and clean. And it uses a similar movement to the Smith's watches from back in the day. And uh, yeah, it's just, it's just, you get to roll. And this is a Smith's Everest. This is the 39 mil variant. I would imagine the Mark I. This was the original that came out. And they have since made 36 mil models of this piece. And uh, it's good seeing them side by side. It's nice to see that there's a Smith's Everest on the show that's not mine, which is cool. Have seen Dear Artifacts, Smith's Everest in the past. So thank you for these, two old for two wheels. Next from Watch and Pray, Hulk next to the Parthenon. I hope I'm saying that this, this is the Greek Parthenon. Great looking. This is And it's an overcast day, so we get to enjoy. This has to be one of the best shots I've seen of the Hulk Submariner. Last few coming up, and there's some great watches. We're actually going to end on a high with the last five pieces or six pieces coming up. Um, the nice thing is that folks like Zane, Russell, Founder, et al, hang out with all of us, regular folk, showing our standing. And that's it, but it really is such a pleasure. I mean, the real watch enthusiasts are ones who not only enjoy the, the horology and the high end, but just everything else in between because not only is there value to be had, but uh, we enjoy design, we enjoy detail. And what, what's nice about this show that I hope everyone likes about it is that we get to share our individual tastes, what we like to share and show. This is the best, Thank, um, from, and this is from Watch and Pray. If you're in the chat now, this is the best shot I've ever seen of the Hulk because it looks like an emerald green. Just imagine this as the finish for this watch instead of the bright, bright green that we know. It looks so dressed down and formal. That to me, that's the one the one gripe I have with the Hulk is that I just think it's too green. It's just too brash. Where in this configuration, it just skirts under the radar, but you know what it is. Overcast day, absolutely. And we got the Parthenon in the background. Great shot. Thank you so much for this. We uh, watch and pray. Looks like a black sub. It does, right? Okay, moving on. This is from Wesley. Now, Wesley sends in quite honored <laughs> yeah that's no, really really nice shot thank you for setting this in from wesley now this this is a gem and before even addressing what this watch is if tudor is watching tudor if you're in the chat please please recreate your submariner to look exactly like this exactly like this uh, bud owens thank you for joining if you're on your way 
Uh, I've only got a few to go. I don't know if you want to miss Zane's watch because it's quite the quite the winner. This is how Tudor needs to recreate their dive watch. If they can make a Submariner just like this, it's the way. And I say that because I've mentioned in the past that they have used our hands that don't have a Mercedes layout. This to me, oh, it is gorgeous. Chuck the, you might chuck the, the, the date complication and just put another triangle in there. You have a winner. It looks so good. <laughs> uh, what was, uh, there was a comment saying, Tudor in the chat. Be great. You know, if someone, if a rep from Tudor was here, uh, my email is in the description if you'd like to reach out. I'd love to help you guys. <laughs> uh, but if Tudor was to recreate the sub, I think this to me is just, it's a win. Looks great. And uh, so let's just highlight the, the watch itself. It's from 1984 from Wesley. And it's a reference 96100. It's a gorgeous piece. This to me is the Tudor sub in its purest form. The snowflake and the Tudor sub are completely different animals. And I, Tudor has left the chat. <laughs> Uh, I think the snowflake and the Tudor sub are different animals. They should be put in, in different pens, different uh, exhibits. But this, to me, as far as the Submariner goes, it's unique enough that Tudor can put their name on it. But at the same time, uh, it calls back to those vintage uh, aesthetics. And uh, yeah, always great. And there's another shot of it on his wrist. We get to see, I think, what do you say? He's an Australian living in Hong Kong. I think that was his, his backstory. I mean, how good does that look? It is stunning, really is gorgeous. Nice seeing the high top crystal, all Rolex parts, as we know. Rolex parts with a simple layout, ETA movement, bulletproof. Um, I, it wouldn't have the Submariner name or the bezel. Zane, yeah, absolutely. The bezel, I'm sure they wouldn't, they wouldn't gradiate it. Uh, the insert, they'd probably change the typeface and everything. But the dial to me, I think it's just, what, what's nice about this layout and just talking about correspondence between elements, you have round hands, round plots, round hand, round plot. <laughs> then you have a pointed hand, you have a pencil hand, and then you've got your jagged quarters. It's just there, there is symmetry, ladies and gentlemen. Is it so difficult to deal with symmetry nowadays? Anyway, a uh, great piece. So thank you, Wesley, for sending this in. Now, I love, love the age and the patina. I think this was a birth year of his as well. Okay, moving on from We Watch Guy. Tried to take a good shot of the lighthouse in the background and succeeded. We watch guy loves wearing his watches on his right wrist, which I fully accept. Wesley, you're in the chat. Fantastic. Thank you so much for joining. And uh, I see many of you are logging off. Yeah, we've got a few more to go. Three more watches to go and we're done. So another rupiah. We watch guy loves this piece and he has an amazing collection, tight knit collection of watches. Uh, okay, I know it's a bad wrist shot. <laughs> <laughs> but it was raining out, wanted to get the lighthouse in. Don't worry, there's no judgment here. It's nice to see some context, overcast sky, and the root beer really does, uh, it's a nice, no, why I say root beer? The Pepsi really does have a, a charm to itself. And again, overcast lighting, you get to appreciate the subtlety. Why is it that overcast lighting brings out the best of these modern pieces? I mean, just look at these two side by side. You get to enjoy that that little detail. It's a Pepsi. <laughs> Why did I say root beer? Yeah, three hour, three and a half hours. You can imagine, I'm uh, I'm running on fumes here. Okay, best bracelet. Yeah, it is. It is nice. Interesting that some people have said. I, th I think Founder Times Capital mentioned it earlier that um, the bracelet quality has been lacking lately. That some of the finishing hasn't been as good. The tolerances. Uh, there's been all sorts of talk about Rolex and their quality control over time. I'm sure it's still fantastic. I'd love to. I've never tried one of these on. I would love to get hands on time with one of these pieces in the future. Okay, last two. Williams watches. His OP34. He is always sending it in. I think it's a 34. I hope. <laughs> I didn't put the reference in. But he's got a Rolex clock at home, I think, in his garage or somewhere. And nice seeing it on display. This champagne is always featured at the end of the show. And uh, it's the double batons look great as far as oyster perpetuals go. OP36, yeah, thank you, thank you, sorry. Um, as far as as far as the the placement goes, and the, the idea of just the simple watch that you can wear, also really appreciate the squared off aesthetic. You know, it looks like a real oyster case, and this this dial is so vibrant. You see it in different lights. I think I've featured it on virtually every show. Some lights it looks brick red. Some lights it looks like mustard. A very light champagne. Yeah, it's just terrific. 
too many Rolex watch aficionado. Well, we're going past Rolex and beyond in this last one. We're going to uh, space. We could say we're going astronomia in a way. Are we ready for the final watch of the show? From Zane, if you're still there. Grape Dial is very nice, Zane. You're right. Last but not least, from Zane. Here we go. This is the reference 6102P. And it is a celestial... I, you know, you won't believe it. I actually pulled up a tab to study up on this watch before the show began. And it was like five minutes before the show, and I just couldn't get around to it and everything else in the room. But as far as things go, I mean, this this watch tracks the movement of the stars and the moon in the sky. You've got a separate date uh, hand that runs around the dial. Uh, please, by all means, Zane, give us more details if you like on this this model but it is a heavy hitter they've only made they've made so few of these i would imagine in and around 50 and 100 on the wrist right now he says yeah it's great i mean zane always likes being last and it's great to feature this at the end of the show thud goes the microphone yeah i mean it is i i for the life of me still haven't even researched this piece enough but what i do know is that it tracks the stars and the moon as the as the year goes by and the quarters it's please Tell me more about this piece. Uh, it is a gorgeous, it's a gorgeous watch. Love the highlights and the lighting, everything, just the composition. Zane always manages to to hit the mark. Zane and Russell, they are in fact in the same club, and uh, they do have lots of banter back and forth between each other. Tim just did a review of this watch. I think I remember BS. There was there was talk about this. Was it on his uh, his weekend watches or whatever else? Uh, Red Coast. Let's get right into the dial. I'm holding back. One element that I find peculiar with this watch, don't crucify me, looking at the, uh, the north, south, east, west, I find the typeface to be slightly too modern compared to the, the, the basic numerals. Actually, I look at this and I think of the 6006. I would imagine that they were made in and around the same time. No? And... I just see the numerals here. It looks to me, it looks like the north, south, east, west is a little bit more stylized than the, the Patrick Philippe name and the typeface on the dial. Wondering why they decided to go with this this thicker font around it. Because I mean, the hands are just so elegant, skeletonized, clean, clear. Look at that dial. Can you please explain, Zane, what this dial is made from? Because it's just it's incredible. How how is it that there is actually a drop shadow behind the stars? Are they actually printed above? the dial and I mean it's all three-dimensional I, I don't know it's just it's above and beyond me <laughs> and I also noticed that, uh, that these little red accents don't line up I'm guessing they also revolve with the whole setup as the astronomer Ast astronomia I, you know three and a half hours I'm running on empty but yeah it's it's a gorgeous piece so unique I've, I've I think we featured this once on the show before and it's a gem a real, real gem. And Thomas Burnett, thank you so much for the super chat, as always, man. Stay safe and clean. I'm sure everyone's logging off now. I mean, this is the last watch of the show. Uh, Aventurine Dial, Forsley. Okay, here we go. From Zane, Sapphire Disc Dials. One is blue, next is stars, and then the fixed compass. Yeah, too many typefaces. If you have to use more than two typefaces in anything, uh, you have jolly good reason. Yeah, I, I must say the one that's the one element that stands out to me at least from from observation. But it's a modern classic. I mean, I would imagine this lines up directly with the six thousand and six, the reference six thousand as well. I think they were this, in and around the same. But the style, I mean, so this changes every day. I I really I know less than nothing about this watch. If this changes every day and you get to just see this whole platform rotate, you know what I'd love to see a time lapse of this over the course of a month. Just seeing how it all moves. I'm sure this this was a part of their marketing campaigns, uh, campaign. Um, you can also have a fourth element, which is a moon phase, which follows with the movement of the dial. Yeah, I mean, it's just amazing. I'd love to see this watch in action. So, uh, yeah. I mean, it's been a pleasure. And Chai Town, thank you so much. The dial moves full a full 24 hours. Is that so? Oh, I see. So every day, you, you every day you get to actually enjoy this dial doing a full rotation. I cannot believe it. That is amazing. Uh, but I would, I'm sure it would have an exhibition back, Frank, for sure. 
This is great. So I'm going to stop here. We've been running for three hours, 45. That is freaking ridiculous. I don't know how I do it, but I do. Everyone, I can't thank you all enough for sending in your watches. I mean, it's it's always just such a pleasure sharing these pieces with all of you. Don't open up. Don't open up photos. What are you doing, dude? Um, it's been a joy. It's been such a pleasure. And I really hope you're all doing well, looking after yourselves. This has been an amazing show, as always. It's just seeing that variety. The watches on offer are always incredible. And, yeah, I mean, what else can I say? Are we at halftime, Buganish? <laughs> And Russell, thank you for sending in your pieces. I wanted to keep this subtle and understated, but the stream ended up being just, as always, just crazy watches out of the blue. And it's yeah, it's always a joy doing this with all of you. I hope you enjoyed it. And until next time, I'm really thinking of taking a break over the course of this week coming. Mr. Perpetual, thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to be taking a break over the course of this week, I think. Put a week aside and just not think about watches. Maybe do another show next week, Saturday. But until then, you know, it's, it's, it's me preparing new videos to come out as well as pushing videos out. And it can be a bit of a, uh, a schlep at times. But, yeah, all being said, thank you all so much for joining. Have a terrific weekend or Sunday and enjoy yourselves. This is a time where we get to be a bit more creative. Really try and pick up a hobby if you can to keep yourselves busy. This is a time to be busy for all of us. So, as always, be safe. Look after yourselves, and thank you so much for being a part of the show. Um, send me more watches. My email is in the description if you'd like to reach out. Yeah, lots of love. Thank you all, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers for now.